So thank you everyone for being here. My name is Lauren Potter. I am representing the Recycling Works program. I um, work for the Center for Eco Technology as a program lead there and primarily on the Recycling Works program. So we are going to kick things off this morning with a few welcomes and updates. Um, I want to thank Ben Harvey and Yale Harvey, all of the staff that we bugged this morning many times getting this room set up. Was very appreciative of the space. We have a very full crowd. So thank you very much for hosting. I also want to note that this 2018 WasteWise Fall Forum is a part of the EPA WasteWise program. And this program is a voluntary program for all types of organizations to um, track, document, set goals for reducing and diverting their waste. We have Janet Bowen from the EPA with us today, and she can help. She's in the back waving. <laughs> she can help anyone who's interested in getting registered for the WasteWise program. It's free. You get recognition for your business or institution or organization, um, and it's a really great program and a way to demonstrate your commitment to sustainability. Similarly, the EPA runs the Food Recovery Challenge. So for those of you with um, food that generate any type of food waste in your operations, that is a similar program that allows you to get recognition for food donation, composting, reduction, everything in between. So without further ado, um, I want to hand it over to Ben Harvey, president of EL Harvey, to get us started. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to EL Harvey and Sons. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful day out there. Luckily, we didn't try to do this on Tuesday. We would have washed ourselves down the drain of John Hoy and see him come in. And um, I feel like I should do an introduction, but I think that probably 95% of you know me and know our company and know what we do here. But um, uh, just a, again, thank you for coming this morning. I'm very glad to have you here. Uh, it is a tight room. Um, we, I think we did have to shut off uh, in, invitations uh, as we <laughs> move forward because of the, the tightness of the room. But uh, So uh, a, a couple of things. Eel Harvey & Sons Full Service Waste and Recycling Company. We've been recycling for over 70 years here. Uh, at this location, believe it or not, it wasn't always looking like this with all these, these buildings and complexes here. Uh, on our campus here in, uh, in Westboro, um, we have a, uh, an office paper recycling operation. We have a commercial dirty murk. We have a MSW transfer station. We have a construction and demolition recycling facility. And we also have a, um, a food depackaging operation here which somebody said that they'd like to see that, but I just got word that we are down this morning. We uh, we blew off one of our paddles on our turbo, so we are not operating our, our depackaging today. It was down last week and now down today. It's the uh, it's, it's the fun of uh, running an operation. Uh, okay. Things things happen. So unfortunately, you can still look at it, you just won't see it operating. And, uh, on a, and, and also, I skipped over, we have our, um, our single stream recycling MRF, uh, it's actually in the town of Hockington, but it's a contingent piece of property here. And uh, I think most of us uh, wanted to go and see that, that tour afterwards. Um, after the meeting, as we saddle up to go over there, we are gonna have to, um, I don't have transportation, and it's a little bit longer walk than, uh, than we wanna do today. So we'll just kind of meet up. We'll put on our safety vests, except for the guys that came dressed for the, uh, we appreciate that, <laughs> watch your own stuff. And uh, so we, we won't have to get those guys dressed up, but we have vests and, and glasses. And um, not sure how many are planning to stay for, has anybody got an idea if they're staying now or not for the, for the, for the tour? Yeah. 99% of you, so <laughs> that's good. Well, you, we'd love to have you go through there, and I'm trying to make arrangements so that that will still be up and running. Hopefully, nothing will go wrong in that <laughs> operation until we can get over there and take a look at it. Um, overall, in our complex, we uh, we do about 500 tons of MSW a day. We do about 500 tons of CD a day. Um, our other operations, we do approximately 100 tons of uh, commercial um, so separated material and uh, what we call a, a dirty loads, mixed loads of, of material. 
Um, we also, in our paper operation, I think we're doing close to 75 tons a day. In our single stream, we are up to about 320 tons a day that's going into our single stream operation right now. And one of the things that I'm, I've got to be careful not to do my presentation as I stand up here with my walk on my remarks. And, uh, we are going to be talking about the uh, the issues that are facing us in, in single stream recycling and in our in, both in our commercial and uh, in our in our um, in our municipal single stream. So I guess if there's nothing else, I'll turn it over to who's going to be back to you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. So before we dive into some of the material for today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Recycling Works in Massachusetts program. Many of you are familiar with us, although I know some of you aren't. Um, and then for those of you that already know about the program, I'm going to talk about some of the new resources and things that we have coming soon. So Recycling Works in Massachusetts is a program funded by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection and delivered under contract by the Center for Eco-Technology. This is a program that provides free assistance to help businesses and institutions maximize reuse, recycling, and food waste diversion opportunities. Um, through this program, we have a wealth of resources on our website. We have a Find a Recycler tool on our homepage that helps you identify recyclers and processors of a variety of materials. We have a sector-specific guidance based on an about 10 different business sectors, and we have a number of best man management practice practices that are on specific topics that we identified as you know, a need in the marketplace that we needed to do some more research and provide guidance. So that includes things like food donation, contracting with waste haulers, force reduction of food waste, and coming soon, furniture and equipment reuse, which you'll see a little bit more about. So in addition to all of the great resources online, we have a hotline that we run through phone and email every weekday, 30 to 5 a.m. We have recycling experts available to answer all of your questions. Um, in addition to the phone and email assistance that we provide for free to any business or institution in Massachusetts, we also can come on site for businesses that have a, you know, a large facility, especially tricky materials, maybe you're not even recycling yet and you just want to get started, we provide on-site technical assistance. Um, this photo shows Heather Billings, one of our environmental specialists that provides that technical assistance. She is an expert in the field. This assistance includes walking through the facility, identifying potential opportunities for waste diversion, prioritizing those for you, doing some cost analysis to see to find the best match, and helping connect you with processors and haulers of recyclables and organic. Um, this technical assistance can also include things like training for your staff on best practices, customized signage for your waste bins, um, and a plethora of other services. It's a really awesome deal if you haven't gotten technical assistance from us before, or even if you have and you're interested in learning more, please talk to myself or any one of our program staff. So, with that background on the program, I want to give a few updates for things that we've been working on recently. Last time, if anyone was at our Spring WasteWise Forum at College of the Holy Cross, we talked about a couple of case studies that were coming soon. Those are completed and posted on our website. The two case studies have links um, to the written and video versions in these slides that we'll be sharing after the event, although you can also find them on our website. So the first case study that I want to talk about is the Boston Weston Waterfront Hotel in Boston. They have a really comprehensive waste diversion program that we wanted to feature through a special case study. It includes single stream recycling in all of the public spaces, also in all of the guest rooms, and diverting food scraps from the kitchen and prep areas to the Boston Core facility. Um, they have found great success from these programs, and overall, all of their waste diversion efforts save them cut their disposal bill by one third, which is huge for their bottom line. Boston Western Waterfront also has a really great food donation program, so we wanted to pull that out and feature food donation programs as their own case study. So in addition to both West and Boston Waterfront, we also feature a Whole Foods Market location in Medford 
which has an awesome food donation program as well. And you're going to hear more about Whole Foods recycling efforts in a little bit. Both of these businesses partner with food rescue agent, uh, food rescue partners, rescuing leftover cuisine and food link. And these partners connect leftover food to agencies and recipients. Um, and both of these programs also include uh, surplus prepared food donations, which is something that has traditionally been more difficult compared to shelf staple foods. So it's a really cool, unique aspect of their programs that can be replicated. And finally, this is nearing completion, but still coming soon. Uh, last time, if you were at our Spring Waste Wise, we held a brief discussion around corporate and institutional office furniture and equipment reuse. Ooh. We are developing best management practices for that. We'll be sharing a draft very soon um, with all of you, anyone on our list. We'll be inviting comment from stakeholders, anyone that has experience with this, to help make our document the most robust resource it can be. And then it'll be posted uh, on our website and distributed through our newsletter and social media channels to help guide uh, businesses and institutions in making sustainable decisions about their furniture. Uh, another new feature on our website that um, you can use today is the Contact Us form. So in addition to calling our phone, phone number, emailing us, you can now access uh, Contact Us directly through the website in a streamlined format using our contact form. It's just like calling the hotline, and we'll get back to you just as soon as possible, um, usually within the same day or the next day if it's late in the business day. And I wanted to highlight our food waste page because we're not talking a lot about food waste today. I wanted to draw attention to that. We've recently sort of reorganized our main food waste page on our website. You go to the home page, just click on food waste on the top menu, and we have organized all of the resources that we have on food waste into this single page. You'll see that there are links to different aspects of the food recovery hierarchy, as well as tips for complying with the organic plan. Uh, so definitely check it out if you're not familiar with these resources already. And a couple of more things that are coming soon. Very relevant to today's agenda um, in light of all of the market changes and challenges that have sort of, you know, motivated the topic for today. We are realized that Recycling Works didn't have a comprehensive resource just on best practices for collecting single stream recycling. So that is information that's going to be coming soon. We'll be, you know, doing some interviews with relevant stakeholders, definitely incorporating some of the information that we learned today. We also have, uh, this is listed as coming soon because it's not on our website yet, but these are hot off the presses, ready to go. We have new recycling um, trash and organic signage that we can provide for free to businesses and institutions in Massachusetts. These are examples of a couple of them that we made for one business, um, and they're also customizable. So we can adjust the recycling. If you have dual stream, we can make you a dual stream sign. If you don't want napkins because your food waste is going to animal feed, we can customize that for you as well. You can even um, put your organization's logo on the signage, things like that. So this can be provided. It's often provided as part of technical assistance, but if you don't need technical assistance, we can also just provide signage on a one-off basis. And finally, I want to draw attention to um, our next big event, which is the College and University Forum. I know we have some representatives associated with colleges and universities in the audience, so I strongly encourage you to keep an eye out for this event on March 7th at Wellesley College. Um, it's a really great place to network with other sustainability coordinators, facility management, food and dining directors, et cetera, et cetera, from colleges and universities. We would love to see you there. Registration is not quite open on our website yet, although the event is posted. So please just give us a call or email if you want to be added to the list early. We're happy to get you on there and we'll keep you posted with any updates. So with that, I will leave Recycling Works information up here. Um, I also have cards on the table and brochures that tell more about the Recycling Works program. So please pick one up or grab any of us to talk more if you're interested. And I'll take any questions about the program, if there are any in general, about this background information. What I expected. Okay, well, great. I could, I mean, sure. It's fun to just skip background. So 
just for an example, how many people? Oh, sorry. That's okay. Heidi Meyer, um, citizen enthusiast. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, just for fun, how many of these types of institutional businesses have you taken on recently? I mean, what, what's the momentum sure. or quantity? Yeah. So we have great momentum in the state of Massachusetts, and um, in fiscal year 2018, which ended in at the end of June 2018, we assisted approximately 1,500 businesses or institutions in some way. That could be through a very quick phone call, pointing them towards the right recycler, all the way up to a months-long engagement where we assisted them with you know a variety of aspects of establishing a new program, troubleshooting, on and on. Um, we have a goal this year of uh, on the order of about 200 businesses providing them in-depth technical assistance. Um, so hopefully that gives you some idea. We uh, have helped a lot of businesses, but they take it, you know, they take our assistance and they take it from there. So it's a lot of credit to all of the businesses that have pursued programs. Great. So thank you for the question. Um, with that, we are going to transition. I'm going to hand it over to Brooke Nash, who's the Branch Chief Municipal Waste Reduction for the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. She is filling in for John Fisher today, so we really appreciate it. And she's going to provide uh, some Mass DEP updates and sort of set the stage a little bit for why we're focusing on this topic today and the market changes with regards to recycling. Thank you so much. So John, uh, if you are regular at Waste Waste Forums, you probably know John Fisher, my colleague, who heads up the Commercial Waste Reduction Program. Um, we sort of split our work at DEP into the sector or the constituents. So John's branch or constituents, if you will, are commercial and institutional business um, folks, and I work with municipalities, so cities and towns and schools. Um, Throughout the throughout the Commonwealth. So anyway, John is home, unfortunately, possibly with flu. He thought it was a cold, and uh, John, who's here, it works in his his branch. Um, and I got an email yesterday saying, I don't think this is just a cold. I think this might be the flu. So we haven't been anywhere near it. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. right. Haven't seen him in a couple days. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. We are glad he is home <laughs> and hopefully recuperating and not here. Um, so uh, you got me today. Um, so we'll change your pace. Um, so I am, um, John passed his presentation on to me. I made a few little um, of my own edits, but wanted to give you an overview. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the recycling market changes because, of course, we have Ben Harvey here who will be talking to you, um, I think, right after uh, me. Um, and you'll be able to hear it from the, the horse's mouth. Um, but you know, as we, as you probably have heard, if you are engaged in the recycling world, um, when China announced its uh, policy known as National Sword, actually that summer of 2017, but they imposed the restrictions um, just about a year ago, um, January of 2018, sort of it turned the recycling world on its head. Um, China had been a major, major importer of um, scrap paper and plastic from the U.S. for decades, for at least a decade, probably a decade and a half. Um, and during that decade and a half, the capacity and the domestic capacity, the, the paper mills and, and facilities that accepted, uh, used to accept our scrap paper and plastic um, started shutting down. Frankly, China was able to, to do this cheaper. The Chinese government built mills. Starting 20 years ago, they were state of the art. A lot of the mills in the United States were old, they were aging, dinosaurs um, just couldn't compete. And so China opened up a great opportunity for um, scrap materials to go overseas and be marketed. They have a, um, there's a huge demand for the material. Um, they take our scrap paper um, and make it into boxes and shipping containers and then send us back the goods, think sneakers or electronic devices or you name it, um, Christmas lights. Um, those are coming back in packages that were most likely made from material that we exported to them. Um, I recently learned actually that Boston, the, the single largest um, 
import out of Boston, Boston's port is actually scrap material. So waste, paper, metal, plastic, Ben's nodding his head. So I'm glad I got that right. I, I learned that at the uh, Northeast Recycling Council conference in Hartford, Connecticut last week, which was all about markets and about um, MRFs, our material recovery facilities, um, which is what we've got here on Ben's, uh, Ben's campus. So anyway, um, the, the National Sword imposed very, very strict restrictions, essentially um, shutting down um, the, the export of mixed paper and mixed plastics to China starting about a year ago. Um, this has cer certainly slowed down the movement of recyclables. Um, it is meant scrambling for, to find other markets for materials. This material is still moving a lot of it overseas to Southeast Asia, and then we'll, we'll um, give you more of that picture. Um, really, again, as I mentioned, um, you know, paper, mixed paper and plastics are um, we've had the biggest impact in that. Um, and then at the same time in Massachusetts, sort of to make to you know add insult to injury. Um, our glass container manufacturer, a company by the, um, by the name of Ardaw, that's been operating making glass bottles out of 80 to 90 percent recycled glass in Milford, Massachusetts, in the 70s, announced they were shutting down last March. So um, the impacts of this glass is a um, is a material that depends very much on regional markets. This this bottle manufacturer served um, a lot of the New England region, and suddenly we were without a um, market for our, our glass bottles and, and um, jars. So kind of a double whammy. Um, I think, you know, when you take, when you look at our the typical single stream, um, you know, container of materials, um, about 65, 70% of that is going to be paper and glass um, by weight. So you've got, you can see a majority of those materials are now um, having to travel a much longer distance in the case of finding glass outlets um, or uh, find alternative markets. And um, because of the glut of, of, of waste paper and plastic due to the Chinese um, restrictions, we're, we saw prices just take an absolute nosedive. So while the material is moving slowly to other markets, it's certainly a buyer's market um, since China is no longer buying. And so what uh, what operations like Ben Harvey are getting for a ton of mixed paper is just a tiny fraction of what they were able to sell that material for, if they're even getting paid at all. Of course, then you factor in shipping, um, shipping, and I think Ben will probably talk a little bit about that, but the shipping to China was very inexpensive because of a backhaul opportunity. Um, that's not true when you're sending to Vietnam or to Indonesia, um, to Turkey, to, I've heard of um, folks sending material to Italy, so really you know, moving to different parts of the world without the backhaul. Um, benefit from um, materials that we're consuming from those from China. So, um, so what has DEP done to to help um, both um, you know the private sector and the, the public sector, both of which are deeply engaged in recycling? So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, an outreach and education campaign um, called Recycle Smart. Um, you did hear from um, Lauren about the assistance that we provide through Recycling Works. So I won't. Um, focus much on that, and then a little bit about recycling business development, so how we're trying to put some funds towards um, entities that are managing this material, that are, that are providing local markets. So outreach and education, um, this initiative, I want to give a shout out again to our industry partners. Um, you know, we've, for years, and I think this is part of how we wound up where we did, the, and I say we, meaning the whole United States and even Europe, is um, We've, recycling became pretty mainstream. Um, most of us have recycling at home, often in our offices, at schools, and we put our stuff in the bin and it went away and we didn't really think about it again. Um, the problem was over the years that people started putting in materials that didn't really belong in those recycling bins. Um, that China had quite a, a, a considerable tolerance for taking the good stuff with the bad. They were able to sort it out. Obviously their labor is cheaper. Um, there and uh, so, as far as we all knew, everything was everything was good. Our materials were getting collected. Um, we were throwing things in the recycling bin and um, weren't hearing that there were any problems with that. Well, that all changed with with China National Sword. And what we realized is we really need to get back to the basics and educate our consumers, whether it's at home in the workplace or at school, 
about what we really want in that recycling bin and, and even more importantly, what we don't want. So we sat down with um, the, the private sector, the folks that operate our material recovery facilities. There are eight of them in Massachusetts. And um, this was last December. We had our first meeting. We said, so can we all get together and try and come up with a agreement on sort of a common suite of materials? Is everybody, we agree that everybody wants the same materials and these, and then tell us what your top five or top four problem materials are. So we had very willing partners. Um, ben was actively engaged in those meetings. And um, last May, we came to an agreement um, wasn't particularly difficult. We just we had a couple meetings and came up with a consensus that we had a sort of a smart recycling guide and the the top five things that should not should never be put in a recycling bin. And last following that last spring, um, we hired a marketing consultant DP did to help us implement a, a statewide campaign. We did focus groups to learn what people did and didn't know about recycling, and that sort of confirmed our our hunch that um, people are confused. You know, they thought that it was just fine to put a plastic bag in there. And what most people said is, well, if you look at the plastic bag, it's got a little recycling triangle on it. Why wouldn't I put it in a recycling bin? You know, it sort of stands to reason. So a lot of people um, really were sort of shocked, did not know that they were doing the wrong thing. Um, so we hired this marketing firm to, to go, to do a statewide education and outreach initiative. Um, we dubbed it Recycle Smart. Do your part recycle smart is the full um, the the full campaign slogan, and it really focuses on the top four contaminants, and we'll see a little bit more about that. Um, and then that's that is over under, underlaid with the and here's what we do want. Let's stick to these basics. Let's make sure that we do put all of this good stuff in the recycling bin. So go ahead and. Um, this is the this is the website. If you go to our homepage, um, recyclesmartma.org, um, you will see it's, um, it's pretty basic, but it's um, this is actually it scrolls through. I don't have a live. Um, we're not connected to the internet. I don't have a live version, but this scrolls through with pictures of um, of people doing the right thing with recycling. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, um, we've got the smart recycling guide. We have a video. Again, shout out to our industry partners. They've been able, we had a, a crew out here that did some um, footage at Ben's um, single stream MRF. We've been to several other MRFs. Actually, yesterday, the crew was up in Bill Ricca um, at Waste Management's MRF, interviewing actual workers who work at the MRF and deal with the, the, the plethora of materials that come in that shouldn't be there. Um, sort of, we're trying to put a human face on that, so we'll be, you'll be seeing footage like um, that on the website and um, a recycling FAQ, go ahead. Um, another feature on the website is what we're calling the Recyclopedia. It's a searchable directory. You can type in the name of an item. Uh, there are actually four, or over 400 different items. Um, you could type in plastic beverage cup, you could type in coffee cup, you could type in clothing hanger, plastic bag, newspaper, um, sneakers or tennis shoes, and it will tell you whether it's a yes, please recycle it, no, please put this in the trash, or an alternative, which is you may be able to donate this. If it's clothing, you know, donate this to a um, charity or a, to a textile recycler. So um, that, you know, we sort of refer to this as for the alpha recycler, somebody who wants to drill down and get really specific. They want to know whether, what about the plastic straw that, you know, that came with my cup? They will find an answer there. The answer to that one, does anybody know? Is that a yes or a no? No, no, trash. That's a no, correct. That is trash. Um, so we um, just looked at the metrics for this. This is um, we use a company called Recollect that provides the service. Um, and let's see if I get this right. We just looked at our October numbers. We've had twenty five thousand over five thousand people have searched on done twenty eight thousand searches um, since we launched this. Um, just about so it's coming up on three months ago. Um, so we know it's an active site, people are getting to it and are definitely using it. And we can actually see then what the most most searched on items are and straws are up there um, along with plastic bags. Um, along, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right, go to the next slide. I'll just show you a few more. So this is what we call a smart recycling guide. Um, we are encouraging municipalities to 
um, talk with their recycling provider, their hauler, or if they're, they're MRF, they contract directly with a MRF to manage the recyclables um, and to essentially get on the same page. Um, most, most programs reflect probably 90% of what this says. You can see along the bottom, the no's are, um, of course, on the left, well, for the second one from the left, no plastic bags or plastic wrap, but also it's lots and lots of people bag up their recyclables in their home, they tie them in a nice neat knot and drop them in the recycling bin, and they feel like they're doing, that. that's not a bad thing, you know? Um, problem is that when that bag of recyclables hits the sorting line, more often than not, it gets picked up and thrown in the trash. The for folks that are sorting material coming in, they do not have time to tear open bags and empty those recyclables. Um, the loose bags, of course, themselves wrap around the gears, um, the screens, that means multiple shutdowns every day at a MRF where a worker has to literally manually cut the material off. I think Ben will probably talk about that as well and then restart the, the, the operation. Yuck, no food, no liquids. Um, <laughs> that's that's a, a, a big problem. Again, this is what we learned from our industry partners. Um, no clothing or linens. There's a surprising amount. People throw in a, a bed sheet, a towel, um, an old t-shirt. Again, those things become tanglers. Um, we don't want those in the recycling stream. And then lastly, tanglers, which are an amazing number of garden hoses are one of the top ones, um, believe it or not. Holiday lights, um, ropes, um, chains. It's it's just amazing. If, then, if, if you do stay for the tour, you'll probably see a pile with the residue. And um, mm -hmm. those are the things that, that, that Yellow Harvey's employees pull off the recycling stream every single day. I mean, just the, the, the amount of material that is, that is not, shouldn't be there is, is pretty staggering. Okay, let's see what we got next. Um, our partner program. So we launched um, just about a month and a half ago what we're calling the Recycle Smart Partner. Everybody in this room is invited to become a partner. Um, doesn't matter whether you're a municipality, you're a business, you're a, a college or university, or you're even an individual. Um, if you become a partner, it means you will get updates from us. I promise we won't flood your inbox with email. We're sending out an email about every two weeks. Um, you will get information and tips that you can share. We, are, we have a heavy social media presence, so I should have said in the beginning, this is not a, you're not going to see prime time TV ads with this campaign. The state doesn't have the money for that. We are doing, this is very much a um, web-based and social media driven campaign. We know not everybody is on social media, but our marketing consultant tells us it's really the most effective way to reach people. Um, even if you're not on social media, but you are somebody who goes into search with a recycling question, chances are if you put in recycling in Massachusetts, you're going to see a, an ad that comes up at the top of your search and that we probably paid for that. It says check recycle smart, go to this website. So that's how we are driving traffic to the website, even for people who are not using Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, which is where we are actively posting. We have um, we post almost daily on that. We've had some fantastic response. I don't have metrics to share with you, um, but what our marketing consultant says is that our engagement is very high, not only just the number of people who are seeing it. I think we were at five million impressions. Um, as of the end of October, um, which means just eyeballs on them um, on the website, but engagement is very high as well, meaning people are actually sharing the content. They are following us on Facebook or on Twitter. We recently started using Snapchat. If you have teenagers, you might know what Snapchat is. Um, we were a little dubious um, whether there would be a reaction. My boss says, um, uh, it's not in the room, says, kids don't care about recycling at all. Well, apparently they do because Snapchat, we've had an overwhelming response on, on Snapchat. Um, we've been posting videos and information there. So we are reaching, you know, young people. Um, so that, that's exciting. So we invite you to become a partner. You can go to our webpage and click become a partner and sign up. Um, it is free. And let's see, last count, we had 112 partners. The majority of those are municipalities, but we do have a number of growing number of businesses, of haulers, um, of individuals, and community groups. So, um, so please join us, and, and we will keep you up to date about what's going on with the Recycling Smart campaign. Um, just a couple of tips, and you'll hear more from Ben. But you know, one of the things that we've advised municipal, I've advised municipalities, which are my, you know, sort of constituency is 
um, make sure that you are checking in and having regular conversations with your recycling hauler and um, and your MERV. Um, really, when once you know you have a problem, it's better. It's easier to deal with that problem. Um, we know contamination is upwards of 15 percent, sometimes 20, 25 percent, is depending on the community, depending on the level of outreach. So it's really important whether you're, it's your business, um, your school, or um, you're from a, munis from a municipality, and I know there's a few of you here, that you make yourselves aware of, of um, because chances are you're probably paying for it. You probably heard from your, your recycling hauler or your MRF um, about the cost of contamination, and so it's in your best interest to try and understand that and then engage and look for ways to um, provide feedback and direction to, to your residents, to your customers, to your employees. Um, and let's go on to that. I will all say really quickly, we do have a program for the municipal folks who are here called the Recycling IQ program. IQ stands for Increased Quality. We're working with about 20 municipalities now. Um, this is a program to provide really a direct feedback loop, primarily at the curb, but some transfer stations are doing it as well. Um, tagging carts, putting feet on the street, um, on recycling day, lifting lids of recycling containers, looking in the bins and then tagging them and saying, oops, you put the wrong material in. We're unable to take your recycling. Please clean it up. We'll come back next week. Um, it's, it's a heavy lift politically. Some communities haven't gotten there. Many have and are seeing incredible results because we do know that that ultimately probably is the most effective way is really to send that message that this stuff is not okay. We found too many plastic bags, um, hangers, um, you know, tanglers, and so on and so forth. I do want to mention briefly before I run out of time here um, that the other area we're working in is market development. So MassDEP does run a program called the Recycling Business Development Grant Program. Um, this is our program to help folks who are in the business of managing, processing, and utilizing recyclables, um, converting them into a usable feed stock um, or end product. And these are, again, companies that, that operate in Massachusetts. That's the prerequisite. This program's been running for a couple of years now. We just, this week, I think, or late last week, announced um, another $1 million in grants to six Massachusetts companies. And you can see here, one was um, a company that's dealing with mixed recyclables. It was a member, I believe. I'm looking at Sean because he does work on this program with John Fisher. Uh, one for glass. Again, um, our material recovery facilities are working hard to figure out how to deal with glass, and we're looking at a lot of alternative end markets for glass, turning it instead of back into bottles and cans into processed glass aggregate, which can be used as a substitute in a variety of construction applications to um, provide drainage in the place of things like sand and crushed gravel. Um, there was a grant for plastics, and then three for processing clean wood. We had a second round of applications that came in early October. Those are currently under review, and um, we received requests for 3.3 million there. So we hope that um, soon after the new year to announce those awards. Um, Yale Harvey has been a recipient of several of those grants um, over the years, and um, we feel it's a great partnership. It's a way that, again, these are not these are not going to pay for a facility. These are relatively small inputs to an overall capital expenditure, but they, you know, they help. They typically range between two hundred and three hundred thousand um, dollars. So, a company may be paying, for, you know, three quarters of the cost, and the EP's grant will be paying for one quarter of it. Um, just, just a rough example. Um, and then our other program to assist businesses is the Recycling Loan Fund. This is, um, it's a capital, fully capitalized loan fund run by Mass. Let's see, business. BBC Business Development Corporation. Thank you, Sean. Business Development Corporation. Um, this provides fin financing or loans, um, typically for businesses that are not able to get loans from traditional lenders. Um, so uh, that program has been actually running for, gosh, almost 20 years. Um, it was in place when I started at DEP. Next slide. Um, so again, just to sum up, I think, you know, I'll let Ben cover this, but we are seeing a little bit of stabilization. Material is moving, albeit slowly and at low costs. Um, we know there is still a strong demand for fiber. China is not taking it, but China now wants to try and get it through other, um, through other pathways. And one of the recent trends is that we've seen a number of Chinese um, purchases, Chinese recycling companies purchasing mills in the US. 
Um, and the reason is that they've depended on that fiber, that our waste paper for so long, um, their factories still need it to be able to, to, to make their boxes and packaging material. So since they can't import it directly to China, they're gonna get it another way. Um, so that, that's an interesting, interesting trend. Um, and um, we are seeing more regional investment in glass recycling operations. Most of these are, again, alternatives to the bottle to bottle or jar to jar. This is to use it for alternative construction, road building materials. But um, again, sort of in some ways, when a door closes, another one opens, we think. Um, so we're seeing a lot of interest there in trying to find alternative uses for glass. Um, but the challenges are still there. I'm not going to paint too bright of a picture. Um, ben said, and I was talking to him before we started, that he sees a pinprick of light, but he's not sure what it means. <laughs> and I think that's probably uncertainty still is probably the, um, is, uh, probably the major theme here. Um, prices continue to be low, which is why we're paying more to recycle. Um, transportation is a major issue. I won't go into that. Maybe Ben will. And we're still... We're bracing for another winter season. We did see some work capacity issues in the southeastern part of the state um, and, and other parts of the state last winter. We hope that um, we'll, we will, things will have shaken out um, by now. But um, I think that is the last of my slides. Um, just some more resources for you and John Fisher's number if you have questions about, um, about the work that he does. Thank you all for your attention. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Brooke. That was excellent. So transitioning now um, away from sort of the background and introduction um, into the first session that focuses on single stream recycling. Um, so best practices there and demonstrating how businesses and uh, recyclers can work together to find successes. So we're going to hear from Suzanne Woods, Sustainability and Energy Manager for UMass Medical School. After that, we're going to hear from Ben Harvey, again, president of EL Harvey, and we can take questions after both of you have presented, if that's okay. All right, all right. Turn it over to Suzanne. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the recycling program at the medical school. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the medical school, otherwise it's like everything. Yeah. A little bit more closer, please. All right. This better? Much better. Awesome. So UMass Medical School, our main campus is located in Worcester, Massachusetts. We're about 3 million gross square feet. Um, and we consist of a combination of a teaching hospital, obviously a medical school. Um, we focus primarily on biomedical research. We have a lot of lab facilities, classrooms, administrative spaces. Um, and on site, we do have our affiliated hospital, UMass Memorial. This leads to a diverse campus population. So we have a combination of faculty, staff, and students. We have about 8,000. Um, only about 1,000 of those are medical school students. So when you look at us as a university setting, our student population is actually relatively small. Um, but we also face a lot of visitors. With having a healthcare institution on site, a level one trauma center, we see about 10,000 daily visitors. So that lends itself to a whole other set of challenges when we talk about education and outreach. And our clinical partner, UMass Memorial, is the largest healthcare system in central um, in Western Massachusetts, and we have about 50 sites. Um, Eel Harvey is our solid waste and recycling vendor. They have been for about six years now, um, and we run a kind of joint contract um, between the medical school and UMass Memorial. So we have a lot of collaboration between the two institutions along with Eel Harvey. Mm -hmm. So I want to give you a little bit of overview of kind of what our program looks like on campus. So obviously, you know, I'm here today to primarily talk about single stream recycling. Um, we also do some CND and metal. Uh, our single stream recycling um, kicked off about six years ago um, when Eel Harvey took over our contract from our previous vendor. Um, and it's been a slow rollout, in all honesty. You know, again, when we talk about a diverse population, it also means that we have a diverse use spaces on campus. Um, so we started with kind of the visible locations, common areas, offices, classrooms, but we struggled a lot with clinical areas and some of the other places for a variety of reasons. One being it's a little harder to educate visitors who aren't on campus every day, who don't get the regular means of communication. There's a higher chance of contamination, which we always struggled with, also with regards to medical waste and some of the other challenges on that front. 
And then with labs as well. So same type of thing. You know, there's a high risk of contamination when you think about where to situate lab recycling, what to collect as part of lab recycling programs. So it falls outside of the kind of traditional bottles and cans that everybody is used to. Um, so our lab recycling program specifically, we rolled out in very close collaboration with Gil Harvey, but as well as our environmental health and safety staff to make sure that everybody was on the same page as far as what was going to be okay with going in the bins. So we'll see some signage that we pulled together for that as well um, a little bit later. Um, we also do kind of electronics recycling, bulk items and white goods, and confidential paper recycling um, that fall out a little bit outside of the general single stream recycling, which just lends to the complex complexity of the recycling system in general at the institution. Also, because we are a healthcare institution and a biomedical research facility, and there are a lot of students and a lot of move outs, um, we also look at significantly at donation opportunities or reuse opportunities. And this is because a lot of the items that we generate on campus aren't going to eventually be able to be recycled, um, or it's more challenging with single stream recycling. You know, we see a lot of lab equipment and things like to that nature that come in and out of our facility, um, even pallets. Um, so, for instance, we, we have a lot of shipping coming in and out of our docks on a regular basis. You know, we're servicing, as I said, three million gross square feet of campus. So we started donating those. In um, about 2015, we kind of formalized a reuse program where we kind of said, all right, Harvey, you know, you've been picking up our pallets for a while, but maybe this isn't the best option, right? Maybe it's better if instead of them going to C&D recycling, that they we have an opportunity to extend their life a little bit longer. Um, and so working with our distribution house, um, we were able to just essentially give those to truck drivers as they came and picked up <laughs> our goods. You know, we donate about 15 pallets a day. Um, that ends up being close to 4,000 a year. So it's a pretty actually substantial portion of our waste stream um, that isn't often thought about. Um, also, to comply with the Massachusetts Organic Waste Ban, um, we do do pre-consumer food donation. And this goes directly to a pig farmer. Again, another kind of easy relationship. You know, it's back of the house. We don't have to worry about, you know, interacting with the consumer side and having bags or anything that's non-edible end up in that food waste. Um, but again, it's a close collaboration um, with our food services vendor, obviously, for, for that one. Um, and one of kind of the programs on the reuse front that I'm most excited about um, is a program called our Swap Shop. Um, essentially, my institution allowed me to squat in the old lab space <laughs> until further notice. Um, we've relocated three times in three years. Um, but at the end of the day, that, that's not so much what matters. Um, it allows an opportunity for people to bring good items um, that were bought by institutional funds to be used by people in the institution. Um, and so, you know, lab equipment, if someone replaced their water bath, but it's their old one's still in good condition, they can bring it to the swap shop. Um, same with some small furniture, the rule of thumb is you have to be able to carry it yourself. <laughs> I don't want giant giant fume hoods or anything of that nature. Um, because you leave it up to them, they'll, they'll make those kind of decisions. Um, but it's one of those cool opportunities so that just beyond single stream, um, we do have a lot of other programs that are managed in place as well. So some of our program, whoa, that was weird. Um, so how do we kind of manage these diverse programs, right? Especially with regards to single stream recycling and how do we make sure that we're providing Harvey with a clean waste stream? So first we do a lot of communication and outreach and we'll go into this a little bit more detail. Um, how we strategically place our bins is also really important. As I mentioned, having a diverse campus means that where we put them makes a difference on how people view and manage recycling within their area. We try to develop innovative programs. Um, we do a lot of audits a lot of audits. Um, and then develop a support network as well um, with a combination of faculty, staff, and students. So communication and outreach. Um, our signage is a big one. Um, again, we have a very diverse campus population. So we have everybody from PhDs to visitors. Um, and so how we communicate is really important. Um, one of the things that was important to us that we use pictures and this was really because we weren't sure especially on the visitor front with being in Worcester that English was going to be everybody's first language or the language that they were most comfortable in. So we wanted people to be able to walk up to a sign, match an item, and know whether it goes in the trash or recycling. <laughs> so we took an interesting approach and instead of just having a recycling sign we also paired them with trash signs. Um, and we've done these for specific areas. 
again, what you find in a lab setting is going to be significantly different than what we find in an office area. Um, and so we made signage that matched those. Same thing with clinical settings. You know, we have a lot of rigid plastics in the clinical setting that someone would never come across in their household. Um, so again, pairing the signage was key and then developing area specific signage has been really helpful and allowing people to match those items to reduce contamination. We also have a website uh, and some web presence. We run bi-monthly newsletters, again, as a way to just regularly ping people on recycling. Um, our newsletter features recycling pretty significantly. Um, and again, just as an opportunity to remind people where to go for resources, and then any changes in kind of what to expect in their recycling programs. So our other strategy has been to look strategically at where we locate recycling bins. So whenever possible, we obviously try to pair trash and recycling bins together. Um, and for the most part, we've been pretty successful in doing so. Um, it's a little bit harder in the hospital. Um, they have specific regulations which limit the size in quantity of what they consider flammable materials. Um, but again, we've been strategic in buying specific size bins to meet their needs um, so that we can, in fact, pair trash and recycling together because we find that most successful. Um, we try to provide consistency between floors. So if you go into a building, you'll always know that you can find trash and recycling in an elevator lobby, for instance. Um, and again, so that if as you move between floors or within a building, you know where to expect to find these things. You're not searching them out. Um, and then high risk areas. So I obviously like recycling to be convenient <laughs> since this is a program that I manage, but I recognize that sometimes when you make things too convenient, the chance of contamination increases significantly. Um, and so we've chosen not to put recycling in patients' rooms. Um, again, higher risk, harder place to communicate what is and is not recyclable. Um, and then also in labs. <laughs> So labs are already managing a significant number of waste streams that I didn't even talk about in the beginning of the presentation, but they're looking at their trash, they're looking at chemical waste, biomedical waste, sharks, non-sharks. So adding a third bin or fifth bin, um, for my part, was a little scary. You know, I came from a chemical and lab safety background. I did my time in EHS, and and so, so I know how hard it is for labs to manage those, those ones that are already there. Um, so what we chose to do instead is to put bins in what's considered their linear equipment corridor. And this is where they put their freezers um, and some of their equipment. Um, so it was still convenient, but it was essentially a door away from, from the bench space itself. Um, and it's been really successful. You know, our fear is that they wouldn't reuse, that people wouldn't take their empty pipette tip boxes out to the hallway. Um, but that actually hasn't been the case. And we've seen a lot less contamination with things like logs or other things like that by doing it this way. Um, so again, another kind of success. Um, this is an instance where we're not pairing trash and recycling bins together. We've staged kind of specific areas simply dedicated um, for recycling. We also try to be innovative in our approach to our programming. Uh, one initiative that we launched about four years ago was something called Centralized Trash. Um, and this kind of sparked for a couple reasons. One was from an efficiency perspective. We were now looking at rolling out desk side recycling uh, for all of our office occupants. We got some pushback from housekeeping saying, well, now we're doubling our workload, right? We're going from emptying a trash bin to now I'm doing a trash and a recycling bin. You know, a lot of extra added labor time. So we kind of thought about it. We said, if you're looking at your office, what are you generating that's truly trash? So, you know, maybe you'll have a granola bar wrapper maybe some tissues if you have a cold, maybe if you eat lunch at your desk, likely you're not gonna throw that right next to you anyways when you're done. So why, why do, do we really even need a trash bin right there? Is that the, is that the thing that we should keep the desk side? And we said, we said no. We said, we're gonna make people walk their trash to what's considered centralized trash areas, but they get a desk side recycling, you know? And our first concern was contamination, right? As we looked, we're, you know, this conversation is a lot about keeping our waste streams clean. And so our first concern was, are we going to be able to manage a clean recycling stream doing it this way? Or is everybody just at the end of the day going to throw all that crap in their desk side um, bins? We actually had pretty good success. We've had a lot of pushback, don't get me wrong, um, from taking away people's uh, trash bins who think that it's not their responsibility to empty. Um, 
we've had people bring back by their own trash bins. Um, <laughs> so, you know, live and learn. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it's been a successful program. You know, it's been substantial in increasing our recycling rates in some of our lab areas um, and office areas specifically adjacent to our labs. Um, but there were some areas in the school where we, where we still struggled. So, you know, our newer buildings, they all have kitchenettes on each floor. You know, there's spaces to locate these centralized <clears throat> trash locations. Not so much the case when it came to our older building. Um, and so one thing that we did is we um, worked with the recycling work to Mass DEP for a grant opportunity to get mini bins. And so this was kind of the compromising point, right? So if you can't situate a trash bin close to where, you know, the users are working, we give them mini bins. So they can't generate a lot of trash, but at least they're, they're able to, um, conveniently store their trash before walking to the areas. Um, and so again, no successful program faced our challenges, but I think overall it hasn't increased our contamination in any way. And we've definitely been able to capture more recyclables. Audits. So as I mentioned, we do a lot of audits. Um, some of this, actually a lot of this, is thanks to Yale Harvey. Um, part of our contract includes a resource manager. So I'm an apartment of one person. So I manage recycling, but I manage a bunch of other tasks as well. Um, so we have a resource manager who helps conduct audits regularly. Um, and so we do this in kind of two folds. Um, we do annual compactor audits, and this allows us to identify annually what type of material is ending up in our trash and what's ending up in recycling. Um, and seeing kind of how clean they are. It gives us an idea of what opportunities we have, because if you look in the trash and there's a lot of recycling, we know we have more opportunity. But it also gives us an idea of what items are contaminating our single stream recycling as well. And then we do quarterly building infrastructure audits. So this is the more tedious process, where we have our resource manager, usually paired when possible with someone from facilities or housekeeping. To go around to the building, we actually look in all of the bins and we say, all right, one here is trash and one here is, is recycling. Um, and we take pictures so that we can communicate that to, to the staff. And a lot of the things are the things that other people have talked about in the past, you know, um, napkins ending up in recycling. Again, they're paper. You can understand the confusion, just not single stream recyclable. Um, you know, some plastic styrofoam is another one as we talk about, well, it has a recycling symbol on the bottom. True, not single stream recyclable. Um, but it gives us an opportunity to, at this level, to understand where we have to reach out to staff um, on each floor. Um, and we try to get recycling champions. Um, and then what our communication tools are too. What areas do we have to focus on for things that are recyclable and things that are not recyclable? So we communicate these audits to our support network. Um, as I mentioned, we have a resource manager. She provides program support. She helps conduct the audits. Um, she provides training to staff and to departments as needed and as requested. Um, we have a really good working relationship with um, our housekeeping and environmental building services team. Again, they help provide training to departments. Infrastructure placement, they're key and instrumental in helping us decide where to place bins and where it's going to be logical for them to service them. Um, and then they're actually the ones that are collecting and recycling the staff, the, the recyclable materials. So it's definitely important to start to empower them to start to make decisions, to be able to look in a bin and say, wow, I know this is a recycling bin, but it's really all trash. You know, we're going to treat it as such and empowering them to make those decisions. Um, we're kind of unique in that our main dock on campus is managed. Um, by material handlers, so it's staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Again, this is primarily because of the healthcare institution that we support. Um, we want to make sure, you know, no beetles, no sharks, no biologicals, no radioactives, anything like that is going out into our streams. Um, and so they're kind of the last line of defense. So, you know, the carts come down, and they're the ones that ultimately are able to make the determination of kind of where things are going. Um, it's something that's kind of scared me to some degree, uh, but we've audited them as well significantly to say, you know, how good are these, these guys at really making this decision and do they take it seriously? Um, and they do. And I think, again, that's the nature of the operation and, and how they have to run from the dock. Um, 
And then we have recycling champions. Moderate success, we'll be completely honest. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but they provide peer-to-peer -peer training, um, and they also provide us with a feedback loop. So they say, hey, you know, this is what I'm hearing from my department. You know, people still think that, you know, plastic bags are, are recyclable. You know, or we didn't know that you could recycle, you know, sandy white containers. Um, so they are, they're a helpful feedback loop, participation. We'll talk about that in the next slide. <laughs> So we've come a long way, right? But we have a long way to go as well. Um, we continue to struggle with the staff buy and This goes to a little bit to the champions. You know, we have some champions who are really engaged, other ones who signed up to get a free water bottle. Um, so, you know, varying engagement. Um, we also struggle because, you know, a lot of our champions end up being um, graduate students or residents, and they turn over. So our turnover on these champions are usually pretty quick. So we usually only have them for a couple of years. So you get someone really engaged, and then you're trying to find that next person. Um, so it's been a learning curve. So we've learned kind of a combination that champions are great, but you have to develop a program that can exist without them. Um, you know, perception is another really big one for us. So we collect both our trash and recycling in clear bags. We've debated doing green bags, but the hospital has this bag system in colors that is way too complex. So adding another colored bag system, just, you know, green's already taken, red's already, you know, we've already got key colors taken by hospital, other programs. Um, but it means that a lot of people have the perception that no matter what, their recycling is going in the trash. So then they go, well, why do I try, right? Why am I separating it if the end of the day it is going in the trash? So we've struggled a lot with perception and kind of getting the campus community to understand that even though everything's in clear bags doesn't mean that it's all going into the trash um and you know we've tried to go without liners that was one of our big initiatives do we just not not line our recycling right we don't line our recycling anymore. and it was actually made for a more successful recycling program but from a housekeeping management perspective not so much you know we have no way to clean the bins and that that's really what it came down to is that you know well, people recognize it as recycling more. There's not a trash liner in it. Um, you know, overall from a program management standpoint, it just wasn't wasn't successful for us or logistical for us. Um, compliance. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is the diversity of our institution means that we have to have specific restrictions and compliance regulations, um, specifically with regards to fire code. And so that's been a struggle. Yeah, my predecessor actually rolled out an entire recycling program in the hospital only to find out it didn't meet fire code, and we had to pull it all back and kind of take another look and find out if I had to go a little slower. Um, again, it all has to do with the size and the placement of these bins. Um, possibly you have to shelter in place. You know, we're assuming that these patients can't evacuate themselves. So we have to make sure that we don't kind of add, you know, flame to the fire um, in, in a situation if that was ever to arise. We also struggle if bins get moved or disappeared. Um, people will think that, like, they know better. But then they, they, they'll never get empty, right? Like the housekeeping doesn't know where it is. Um, and also, again, it goes back to this compliance thing. And so, you know, we've debated on how do we get things to stay? Do we put bricks to the bottom of them? I don't know. We haven't quite figured that one out. Um, yeah, stickers saying, please don't move. Nobody cares. Um, labeling them where they're supposed to be so we can re try a million things, but they still seem like, I swear we rolled out recycling here. Um, and then, you know, the, the parts have bought their own bins. They think they're doing the right thing. Um, but they'll buy blue bins, which match our bins, um, and use them for confidential paper recycling or things like of that nature. So they'll use them for a waste stream, a recycling stream that's different than kind of how our program aligns. So that's been another challenge just to say, just request a bit if you want one. We'll get you one. We'll buy it. We'll make it consistent with our program. But please don't go rogue. Um, and then we still need broader consistency. Um, and this is, goes a little bit to kind of the changing markets um, that Ben will speak to a little bit more. Um, but the things that we hear all the time are, well, styrofoam has the recycling symbol on it. You know, I can I recycle this at home. And it's like, well, you probably do, but you're probably not supposed to. Um, and so even though we educate the campus a lot, um, there's still some confusion on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Um, and so again, this comes back to, you know, collaboration with your waste hauler. And I think, you know, 
me and Ben met recently to look over our signs and say, how does this change our program or how do we expect our program to change? Because again, we have things that are not going to be on, you know, the, the mass DEP list of lists of things that that Murph wants because they're not going to have, you know, pink wash basins. People don't usually have those at home. Those aren't things that, you know, you see in your everyday life. Um, so I think communication is key. Um, and then we also got a list of things that are like, you know what, don't stress about this but don't promote this. Like I get it's recyclable, but we don't have a market for it. So don't, don't push this item. And, and you know, I think those, that feedback loop is, is really helpful. Cause you know, we were going in one direction with a recycling campaign and Ben was like, yep. Yeah, so technically you're right, <laughs> but let's not do this one. Let's make another item, right? And so but that, that's helpful. You know, the last thing we want to do too, as well as an institution is promote all of these items and lead to that more that confusion that when they go home and it's not on the list that they're they're then confused because there is a difference between what's acceptable um, from a commercial customer compared to a residential customer and so again kind of working to manage that in a way that doesn't prove more confusing to both our campus community and the broader community and so that's pretty much it so that's kind of our program a quick overview of kind of how it works here, some of our challenges, some of our sub stories. Um, but we have an overworked state of questions until after Ben, so I guess I will hand it over. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. That was excellent. Um, and yeah, please, we'll have Suzanne come back up and take questions after Ben's presentation. Um, but once again, we have Ben Harvey, president of ELH. Thank you very much. Um, I, I can go right to questions now because <laughs> Brooke pretty much did my presentation uh, that I was going to talk about early on. Um, I do want to recognize uh, Suzanne. Thank you, Suzanne, for doing your presentation. Um, I, I kind of roped her into this, but then she roped me into a little one yesterday. So we, 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 we work together as a team. Um, where is Mary Martin? She's in the. Mary Martin is our resource manager that Suzanne works with. I just wanted to bring recognition to her and my other. Thank you, Mary. And our other resource manager that's here today is Tom Lynch. He also, he was my first, our first resource manager. Um, little story when we, uh, when we took over rate, when we started with Raytheon, how many years ago you've been doing this, Tom? And, and uh, Tom, yeah, Tom's worked for me and us for a long time. And I said, Tom, I need a resource manager. I don't know what that is, he said. Here we are many years later. So anyway, uh, there were so many things that were brought up in the, in the, in the presentation that Brooke mentioned and, and then uh, things that Suzanne talked about. And I know I'm going to forget these things. So um, when you get to be my age, you kind of bounce around a little bit. So if I bounce around, it's just where I am right now with, uh, with, with everything that was talked about. Um, Brooke mentioned that uh, the light at the end of the tunnel, and I and I said to her earlier, I said I don't know why I've been having nightmares recently about being in a tunnel. I'm not a tunnel rat. I don't want you know closed in places are are not good. But I've had these reoccurring dreams where I'm in these these tight little spaces. I don't know whether and I I don't see that little light. Maybe it's in there. So where we are with our recycling markets, and. Um, and one of the things that, that, you know, as we sit in this room and we, we think about recycling and where we are, and we, we've worked very hard as an industry um, to come up with common practices or best practices to recycle and working on the, the universal list of materials. But it is a challenge when you hear what Suzanne deals with, and we as a, a residential municipal recycler and as a commercial recycler, the different streams of material that we bring into our facility and we and we have to process them so each whether it's umass or raytheon or emc or um you know the town of wellesley all of those streams are kind of similar but yet they're so different and and, and i might get into it in my talk here i'm not sure which which presentation i got rolled up here but uh do i have one of these clicking machines here yeah, right button. So, so um, okay. So a, a little bit of history. Um, you know, we used to we used to do source separation, and I see my friend John Gold in the audience. And we, for years, we we said the single stream isn't going to work. 
We, 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 uh, the mills aren't going to accept it. We're not going to be able to move the material. Source separation is the way we go about things. But uh, source separation was the way that we've collected things in, in the industry. And pretty much my whole history in the industry has been source separation. And you, and you see the, uh, the materials, uh, the way we used to collect it. Whoops. Is that right or is that left? Other right. All right. All right. I got the other right. Don't think about it. Thank you. So anyway, um, the change, the changes. What, what we've seen in the changes in in, uh, in where we are right now, and and we've seen laws and regulations. We have a landfill crisis here uh, in the Commonwealth right now, and we have generator pressure. So. Uh, laws and regulations. There's a ban on the disposal of many materials here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and so we, we must recycle these things. What that does in a marketplace is when you have a, when you have a, a supply and demand market, which is all recyclables are, it's a supply and demand market. If the, the demand goes down, which it has with China, but the supply does not change, we have to deal with that. The material still comes in the door. And uh, we, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it throughout the day here, but at the, uh, Brooke mentioned that this started to take place about a year ago today when China really started to, to back off on accepting materials. Uh, last February, we, we, we had about 6,000 tons of paper sitting on the floor because we could not shut that stream of material off. Uh, landfill prices, we, we are losing about a million tons of disposal here in Massachusetts now. Um, so we got to figure out what to do with, with a million tons of material. And hopefully some of that will be recycled. And then the generator pressure. The people in this room, and Suzanne and, and, and every other business and any other, every other municipality wants this. Their, their members of their, their businesses want this, and we have to provide that service. Um, we, we, talk, I, we, we started office paper recovery programs. Now, the, the main reason I, I left this up here is because uh, you know, this gives me a good opportunity to talk about the changing stream of recyclables. We started office paper recycling programs probably in the early 90s, mid 90s. Everybody had office paper. Those same programs that we operate today, and, and I think that Suzanne would even agree with this, there's not a whole lot of office paper. Nobody, nobody you know, I, I, I didn't bring any paper with me. I just gave uh, Shamita a little flash drive. She plugged it in and off we go. And we got our phones with us all the time. And we look at our phones and we do emails and we don't, we don't print as much stuff. So there's not as much paper out there as there used to be. We've seen the decline in the volume of paper coming into our, our, our paper packing operation really really declined and and um so that's what the, that that it creates a little bit of demand for our tissue mills with the way this office paper goes but the other thing is it combines it with single stream recycling because there's more single stream programs now than there than there were back then so um back in the old days it was better quality control we didn't have to worry about this you know um, we dumped the material on the floor we we'd uh we run it into our balers. We can't do that now because the material is coming in more in, in a different type of stream. This is one of the things that we struggle with as an industry all the time. And um, we, as the, the stream changes, how do we make the adjustments in our equipment? The equipment changes rapidly. The stream changes rapidly. Our single stream operation is approximately six years old. And already we've seen a change in the in the stream of material that comes into our into our plant. Talk about light weighting. You get a you get a water bottle today and you take the top off and you get a shower because if you squeeze it too hard to get the cap off, the plastic is so thin that it comes right out. Well, that all acts differently as it goes through our, our processes here. And, and um, we've talked about flexible packaging. A lot of material now, you get your dish detergent pods, they're in flexible packaging. Your laundry detergent, flexible packaging, all kind of food packaging is, is changing. And, and we have to be we have to be prepared to deal with that. Not only are we dealing with different streams from, from both municipal and businesses, we also have to deal with the light weighting of material. The other thing we've seen a lot of, which 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 has kind of helped us in this last little go-around, is e-commerce. E-commerce is putting a lot more 
corrugated containers into our residential stream than we've ever seen before. And, and, and again, it's okay, our equipment is set up to deal with this, but how do we deal with it now that it's on this side of the, of the street? Today's fiber source, as I mentioned, um, is, is a single stream residential and single stream commercial. Two different streams, but two highly uh, recyclable streams if we do it right and we keep that contamination out. The challenges, the cost of process. When we did a, a dumping, we call it dump and run operation. You dump it on the floor, you push it in the bale, or you bale it up. Didn't have a whole lot of expense. The equipment that we as an industry invest in now, millions and millions of dollars of process material, we need to get that cost back out of it. That's where we've seen a, a, real, a real tightness over the last um, year as China's put these things into, into these, these uh, specifications into place is that it's, uh, you know, Brooke mentioned um, that 60% of the material coming in, it's probably closer to 70% of the material that's coming into our facility right now in the municipal side, I won't say so much on the on the commercial side, but on the residential municipal side, 70% of that has no value or it's costing us to move out. That's with your residue, that's with your fiber, which was going to China, and that's with your glass that has a negative negative thing. So when you're talking about costs and you're saying that the value of that, that ton of material is uh, and I've seen I've seen different numbers anywhere from uh, thirty to forty dollars a ton today might even be less than that I'm not sure where the cost to run that through this these expensive pieces of equipment are north of seventy to eighty dollars a ton you can see where the discrepancy is in, in in the processing part of our operation to to make that make up that difference uh, I mentioned the change in material quality. Um, <laughs> China, China certainly impacted us on both sides. And again, Brooke mentioned it in her talk, and I don't want to, well, I will go talk about it anyway. Um, China came in aggressively. They needed fiber. They came in aggressively, and they, and they as, as Brooke said, they put a lot of our domestic mills out of business because they could buy it. They had big mills. Some of their mills were modern. They needed the material. It was a great backhaul because containers were empty. Containers were going to China anyway to be filled up with material they were shipping back in here. It was a good, good loop that we that, that was going on right there. But it was a very fragile marketplace because all of our eggs were in the one basket, and that and that's that that ended up biting us a little bit. We are seeing, um, you know, then they put it that they've had. I'm not sure how many walls they've had, John. How many walls have we had? We have green fence and blue sky, and there's been there's been three times that the Chinese have warned us that we were we were, we were getting ready to to do something, and we all kind of we as an industry all kind of laughed and said, "Nah, this is not going to happen. They need our fiber so bad, we're not going to worry about it." And I will say that part of the problem was focused back at at all of us because as we as we wanted to do more recycling and get more materials diverted out of the waste stream, you asked our industry to take more and more different things that maybe we couldn't recycle, but we thought maybe we could or we'd work on it and stuff. And we kind of opened up that door. We did get more contamination. Um, we've, we, I've seen some pictures of some horrendous material that ended up in China. And so we kind of we kind of did it to ourselves more or less by by wanting to recycle more things and wishful recycling and not penalizing and not coming up with a with a strategic list that we have working with Mass DEP. We were we were ending up with a lot of uh, a lot of material that was finding its way into the bales of paper that were going to China, and that's where we got our problem: the contamination. Uh, I mentioned the cost. Um, the other, the other thing with uh, with accepting uh, material, non-recyclable material in the stream, and and um, I shouldn't say non-recyclable material that won't flow through our processes the way it's supposed to flow through. When we when we when we are taking time, when we've got a 25 ton an hour machine, and 20 percent of that is material that's not being recycled. That's a lot of material that's going through on a daily basis that just rides along, goes through for the ride, and comes out the other end. If we do not have that 20% that contamination, 
and that was all clean recyclable materials or less contamination, get it down to 10%. Just think of the low material. Brooke mentioned in her thing the, uh, the, the shortfall in capacity. Well, the shortfall in capacity is because we're running our machines to process material that's the run material that's not being recycled. And we just need to get that out. That's another reason that we've worked hard on that to get that out. And of course, the impact, uh, the impact on our revenue stream. The change in material I mentioned earlier, we're, we're, we're seeing, um, which, which I guess from our standpoint, the industry standpoint, the switch from glass to aluminum and plastic is better for us because we do not have a market currently for our glass, as Brooke mentioned. We still have a robust market, even though the, 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 uh, the tariff on aluminum has impacted a little bit the price of uh, aluminum cans, but we still have a market for aluminum cans. So we still have a, a good market for plastic PET, although price fluctuates. Um, so we're, we're happy to see that. I mentioned flexible packaging. Unfortunately, it does, it does um, the, the uh, residue and contamination. And, uh, and I mentioned a little earlier, Brooks mentioned it. There are many, many things that can be recycled. And we don't want to say don't recycle them. But there are a lot of things that need to be recycled separately. Plastic bags is one. There are, there are places to take plastic bags. Plastic film is another one. We handle a tremendous amount of plastic film from different um, uh, different generators, but it comes in separately. It does. You'll see it as we, it doesn't go in through our equipment and wrap. Um, there's, there's plenty of places I think to take clothes, linens, but don't put it in our recycle bin. So there's a, there's a lot of that. And then of course we always get the uh, we're getting the push from a lot of different angles. You know, Starbucks wants to recycle their cups. Well, all well and good, but unfortunately what happens with a Starbucks cup is it gets flattened in the process and ends up in the fiber line and, and it's, then it becomes a contaminant. That happens with flexible packaging. Our, our equipment is designed to do dimensional. Two-dimensional one way, three-dimensional another way. If that three-dimensional gets squashed and is now, now two-dimensional, guess where it's going to go? It's going to follow the fiber line. So we, we uh, you know, we, we watch that stuff all the time to see what's changing out there. Um, uh, less newspaper, more cardboard. I, I mentioned in, in this case, uh, the less less uh, office paper, which is the same as less paper in our homes. I mean, uh, I, I could probably ask how many still get a newspaper in the room and it would be a very small percentage, I would believe. Yeah, yeah it's a few, um, but because we get our news elsewhere. We, there's the constant news. We don't need to pick up a paper and read it unless you're sitting on the uh, on the tee going into work every day. You might want to have something to distract you. Although our phones do the same thing. Uh, other changes, um, you know, Brooke mentioned the flip the lids. This was <laughs> this was a big contentious point when we first started our contamination group. Um, you know, look, why why can't the haulers, why can't the driver of the truck get out and flip and look inside the recycled container and see if it's contaminated? Well, first of all, it would take us two days to, to do one residential contract. The other part of it is is our industry, unfortunately, is 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 rated not one of the uh, safest industries in, in the uh, in the country. We don't want our drivers outside of our trucks. We want our drivers in the trucks. We've automated most of our systems and our routes, so our, our, our residential municipal routes, so our drivers don't have to get out of the truck. And now we're asking them to get out and flip the lid and get back in. It just exposes them to, to slip and falls, um, cars hitting them, <laughs> distracted, I shouldn't laugh, distracted driving is one of the biggest things that's facing all of us, but certainly our industry, as our trucks are going up and down and stopping at everybody's house. And people are texting on their phone or, or or whatever else they're doing on their phones or their computers or eating lunch and drinking coffee and then texting um, and we, we have a lot of accidents that way and we've got uh, we've got many films uh, most of our trucks today um, have cameras in them that we can see what's happening because we need to protect ourselves from unfortunately the public um, a pay as you throw is also uh, uh, and we were talking a little bit about that earlier um, Steve Chang Harris and I you know, it's it's a great it's a great way for the municipalities to pick up revenue, but pay as you throw also contributes to more contamination in our recycles recyclables, and we've 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 seen that. Um, it, it, the increase in single stream recycling. Uh, what is it? How does it work? What is acceptable? Again, we've we've gone through a lot of that. 
Um, very happy with, with Suzanne. Uh, we met last week, I think it was, to go over her list. And we're changing that list. And again, I'll go back and say that the industry, we as a company in the industry, we wanted the recyclable materials. So if we, we wanted them, we would sometimes we would open up a door that we probably shouldn't have opened up and accepted materials that we probably shouldn't have accepted, but we did, and now we're trying to get that door, trying to get that horse back in the barn. There's a little bit of problem doing that. Quality, we mentioned the, the, uh, the green fence, the national sword. I think this is an old slide that I, that I have in there. <clears throat> There's so many things that, that, that they're looking for. It's very, very difficult now to make a product. We, we um, I look at China and they just want to cringe. Um, I don't know if the Chinese market will ever open up again. I, I honestly, I don't. Um, I, I, I'm trying to be optimistic about that. That doesn't mean China doesn't need fiber. I think they need the fiber. Well, where is it going to be processed? Who's going to pick up that slack? Um, we, the, you know, it, it, and, and what's happening now is other countries are looking at the specifications that China has put in place and they're thinking, well, if China doesn't want the trash, why do, why, why does Vietnam want it? Why does India want it? Why does Indonesia want it? So we're getting, we're getting concerned that, that they might implement the same, um, regulations of standardization specifications that China did. We are promoting using our, our, um, industry specs, um, our paper stock industry specs that were have been around for 100 years, John, something like that. Um, and we, we're, we, want the, we want the world to use those specs. And if we need to change them, we'll change them. But we can't have one country have 0.05%, another country have 3%, and another country have 2%. We got we to gotta pack for one, one you know, worldwide market, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, so the other thing with uh, with China, as Brooke mentioned, we are seeing some um, investment here in the United States, Chinese mills. Uh, I think Nine Dragons has bought one in Maine that they're looking to retrofit. Uh, they've got one in West Virginia that is, I believe, is up and operating. I think I'm shipping material down there. I think I should know what I'm doing, but I don't sometimes. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of moving parts. Um, I think Lee and Mann has also been looking at bringing in stuff in. Um, and I, I, I might get ahead of myself here, but I got to think of these uh, to bring these thoughts out when I think of them. Uh, transportation. Um, the, the steamship lines have um, just started to raise their rates. And why they're raising their rates is because these uh, other countries do not import as much material back into the United States as China does. So when you have an empty container that is, that is now empty in Turkey, and now has to be deployed from Turkey to China to get filled up to be sent back to the United States or India or Vietnam or, or Korea or any of the other countries that, that we've been, or Italy, uh, we've um, Brooke mentioned Italy, any of these other countries, that, that empty container now needs to be deployed somewhere else. So it's extra freight, extra cost to get that container there. So we're running into those issues. We, we run into shortage of container issues periodically. Um, so it's, it's, uh, transportation is certainly an issue that's facing us. Um, the value of the product we talked about, we, we've seen, uh, we've seen market, um, fluctuations. This is bigger than a market fluctuation that we're in right now. Um, so when we, when we look at contamination, a few of the things, when we were going through our list, um, with, with DEP and the other processes in the Commonwealth, we look at the things that, that are, first of all, are going to harm our employees, chemicals, sharps, those kind of things. Those are prohibitives. Then we look at things that could damage our equipment, <laughs> brake drums, bowling balls, um, hoses, chains, all of the, the wrap material that, that, will, that will harm our equipment. And then the other materials, straws, somebody mentioned earlier, that will uh, that'll, that'll end up in the fiber line that contaminate our material. So those are the things we look for for contamination. Um, Suzanne mentioned in her thing that they work hard on keeping medical need and needles out. You'd be surprised, or you maybe wouldn't be surprised at the amount of needles that still get into the residential stream, that, that people are, are home medicating themselves, and it ends up in a, in a um, rigid plastic container, that because it's a rigid plastic container and it's got the recycling logo on the bottom, it ends up in the single stream. And, uh, you know, it's a, we, we don't want our, our employees to get 
get, get pricked. Um, things that'll cause uh, that are hazardous. We just went through uh, one uh, with aerosol cans. Now aerosol cans, a lot of aerosol cans are aluminum, are recyclable, but they cause fires. There's still enough pressure and material in there. The first time that we bailed aerosol cans here at our facility, it was like the 4th of July. There was flames shooting out of our bailer. We said, well, we gotta find a different way to do it. And when those cans now end up, I think it was Bobby Cap that said that uh, many of the processors uh, that, uh, that are taking these things have had the same explosions on the other end. So, you know, the fire, fires and ir irritation. And again, back in, I am, and I have no idea why that a baby's diaper is recyclable. <laughs> I don't know whether yeah. people think that we compost it. I, I, I'm not sure why. But it, it's a it's a big issue. The other the other one that's a big issue is is kitty litter. They clean out their kitty litter. They put it in a brown bag. The brown bag's recyclable and it goes in the recycling container. So these are the things that, that the 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 safety issues that we that we have. Uh, we mentioned the the equipment, the wrapping of the materials, uh, and break, break drums. Um, these are just some of the things that we deal with on a regular basis as as we uh, as we process material. Uh, when when we have rain like we did on Tuesday that it poured and we're out collecting municipal recyclables again we don't see it so much in the commercial industrial side of it but we do see it in the residential side that those um, uh, you, you know snow and ice and and rain our equipment we need to run it a lot slower and then we end up with a wet newspaper and if that sits in a container for three months am I running out of time are you, are you sneaking up with me <laughs> yeah. Um, education, we did, we'll talk a lot about education and what needs to be done, um, who, what, how, what is the message. I think we've got that down with the, with the smart, Recycle Smart, the IQ kit. Um, well, what's, what's next? What do we look for coming down? Uh, just some of the things. I'm going to try to, I'll, I'll leave it open for questions here, and I guess that's the last. I, <coughs> that's all I got, or did you shut me off? <laughs> Okay, so if uh, Suzanne wants to come back up here, Suzanne and I would be very happy to entertain one question. <laughs> and if you could just say your questions really loudly, and then when you're responding, if you could sort of repeat the question for those on the webinar. Thanks. Yes. Uh, I have a question for Suzanne. Um, what do you do with the gloves and all? You know, do you upcycle them to a program, or do you just put it in the trash? So we've looked into this pretty extensively, and I'd say this is something that we probably revisit about every two years. Um, it's hard as a research institution. So we don't, our researchers don't have to buy from a single supplier. So right now, Kimberly Clark has their program for recycling gloves. Um, the challenge being that not a lot of our researchers buy Kimberly Clark gloves or buy Kimberly Clark gloves exclusively. Um, so the challenge there is, do they switch? Um, researchers are also very cost sensitive, uh, but we also struggle, you know, when we looked into this and potentially doing it with some pilot labs, is that, you know, we have to be careful in what these gloves were used for as well. So we have to make sure that, you know, if they were used for biological research, they should be going in um, as bio waste, going in bio boxes and not even into the regular trash. So again, it's just this differentiating different waste streams. Um, so we haven't had any kind of first movers on the lab side who have really kind of embraced the idea that, you know, we looked at doing a pilot program, we said, go ahead, but you're gonna use green gloves for your chemical waste experiments. But then it gets complicated too, right? Because you touch a thidium bromide, we don't want that going in, you know, the recycling either, that needs to go out as hazardous waste. The complexities were just kind of too much Love research institutions, not always kind of the best as far as consistent procedures <coughs> with labs. Um, whereas I think kind of institutional um, research facilities can have a little bit stronger hold on kind of just dictating what type of gloves you purchase and doing kind of bulk, bulk purchasing. But at least in our institution, you know, each researcher is responsible for buying their own products. So without that level of consistency, it makes the program really challenging. We have a question over here. That brings me to how much do you work with the uh, purchasing end? Um, you mentioned the recycling bins of bin purchases, but I'm curious how much you are hoping to expand in that area. And then for Ben, how much do you work with the manufacturers? 
Oh, yeah. So how much do I work with purchasing in general on kind of looking at potential for recycling or standardizing to make recycling more comprehensive on campus? Um, so we do. Um, I would say that we do this more on the office product side, um, kind of fewer purchasing and things like that. Again, um, to some extent, um, our labs operate kind of as individual institutions um, within kind of the larger medical center. The hospital is a separate entity, they have separate purchasing, medical school has a separate purchasing. So we do it to some degree, um, but I think we could do better. I think there's a lot of opportunity to work with our suppliers on take back programs. Um, so for instance, you know, we've looked at um, a lot of our labs get kits that have, they come in um, coolers. And so we end up with a lot of styrofoam coolers. Um, again, we've attempted to work with those groups. Um, unfortunately, these kits are something like $10,000 a piece. So the vendor is hesitant to pack multiple in one freezer. Um, because the thought is if it got lost in shipping, you have a massive loss of product. Um, so again, kind of the logistics of some of the items in working with those vendors can be challenging. Um, so we try to focus kind of, again, unfortunately less on the lab side and communicating with kind of vendors that we have this overarching reach. And in many regards, we do this beyond just the medical school. Um, we collaborate kind of at the institution level at the UMass system to work with our suppliers on better take back programs, better transportation efficiency. Um, but not so much specifically around recycling. So uh, on working with the manufacturers, um, the manufacturers put things in packaging because we all will buy them. And we, we, we try to have an open dialogue with the manufacturers when they come out with something new um, that's not as easy to recycle, multi-layered, but it's up to what the, what the public Demands. Um, I just I did a presentation in the spring at the American Packaging, Packaging Association down in DC, and you know all the big ones now, and everybody was there and everything. But at the, at the end of the day, they're looking at, at light weighting is coming about because of the cost of transportation. You know we have a driver shortage not only in our industry but across the country on moving goods. So if they can lightweight a material, whether it's a water bottle or whether it's going from glass to aluminum or plastic. Or, or putting it into a, a, a oil container, that's that's what they're looking at now. So there's a whole bunch of issues that go into there. We try to have that open dialogue because at the end of the day, they're, they're, they might run into regulations that, that are going to prohibit them from doing some of the things they do. But at the end, it's what we as the public will purchase. And if we don't purchase it, then they'll figure out something else to do. There was a question here. Yeah, well, I, I mean, you mentioned that. I, I'm a at the Cranberry, so we're on the manufacturer side of uh, the dialogue. Um, and my question was going to be around kind of what the what would be the biggest advice you would give uh, for a brand that is designing a kit packaging. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously sustainability, we do think about these things, but even something more like in the detail of how you're sorting the materials, I'm curious to hear about your your comment on the Starbucks. Um, so anyway, my question is more: if there's any other wisdom that you'd like to impart on us, to take that. I'm not that wisdom. I'm not that smart. I don't know. Um, again, we're, what what we need to realize is that you're going to change your packaging based on a whole bunch of different things. You know, we and, and for us as a as the processing industry to come back and tell you what to do with your packaging, that that's not going to happen. But what you need to realize as you develop packaging, and I don't, whoever's developing the packaging to move material, that there is an endpoint to that package, and where do you want it to go? So you need to be aware of, of, you know, what's the next step, and and can it be recycled? And if it can't be recycled, okay, what 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 else do we do? What are other things that can we do? Can we use recyclable material to make that product? You know, um, you, you know, and. I, again, I don't have a great answer for that, but we we as an industry need to know what you're manufacturing or what you're putting your, your cranberries in. You know, the, the old cans are gone now. You know, cranberries, you guys, I know, put them in, in foil packs too to ship things around because it's easy, it's convenient, it's so you can zip it up at the end of, if you're not using them all. We understand that, but understand that when it gets to us, it's not a cardboard box, it's not a rigid container, it's not a flat piece of this. Well, it is flat when it gets to us. Unfortunately, it's not fiber. And we just, we, we need to know that. 
if we as an industry need to develop more of, of the technology that's needed, our industry is no different than any other industry. Our technology is changing all the time. Robotics are going to be the next big thing for the sorting. Uh, the, the sorting. I didn't bring it up earlier, but um, we've got optical we can use now, but, but robotics are the next thing. And can we program that robotic to pull out that flexible packaging? Maybe. But then we need to make sure that there's a market for that. We can. The other thing comes about is we can pull all of this material out, but if there's nobody that will recycle that 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 um, you know that packaging, it's going to end up in my yard up there in a pile. Now I'm going to take one more question that was in the back, and I will leave a few minutes for networking, but please come up and grab these guys if you have more questions. It's on the, uh, uh, Susan, it's not the hospital. I just want to make the example about, and then the, the bag with the recycled facility that goes to the river and gets disposed, as opposed to being opened up and processed. Why does a homeowner do that? Uh, they, have, they don't, it's neatness. It's this, I think it's the same, yeah. it's the opposite side yeah. of what you were saying about why you have to collect the recyclables in that bag. Internally at UMass, do you, at medical at the school, do you de-bag those recyclables before you send them to Harvey or do you send them into the bag? <laughs> She's gonna say yes and I'm gonna go over check her. Yeah, no. <laughs> so we actually, again, this is where communication with your vendor is very, very important. So we've looked at this from a couple standpoints. And so again, as I mentioned, we tried to go linerless. Again, that's just in some cases not feasible. What we've tried to do in most of our locations is where we have compactors install cart tippers. So now I would say probably most of our compactors have cart tippers, which allow us to collect loose recyclables and then have it automatically tipped into the compactor. But we still have sites that are container based. Um, and so it's unrealistic to think that, you know, someone my size is going to take a, you know, 96 gallon drum or 96 gallon cart full of recyclables, somehow flip that over their head into, into a bin. Um, so we do, in some cases, collect them in recycle, in liners. Um, we have a relationship with Harvey in which they allow us to, as long as the bags are not tied, and this is the key part, to put them in, because then they can pull them, again, Communication with your waste hauler, don't go doing this road. Um, because again, it goes back to this everybody is different, every scenario is different, you know, every contract, every relationship is different. Um, but we've kind of said this is the only way we're going to be able to do it. Um, it's just not feasible or not from a logistical standpoint, able to collect everything loose. Um, but the key is to not tie it. And so we do have Mary, when she does her audits for us, um, it's one of the things that she checks. And that we have to regularly remind housekeeping um, not to tie their bin, not tie their bags. And it's also a way for when it arrives, as I mentioned, our trash dock, for the guys at the trash dock to know which bags are recycling, which are not, because those are loose. And the only one I wanted to, and that's a great answer, and it's specific and it's a larger generator, but for the homeowner, they wanted, for the municipal folks in the room, they wanted to acknowledge it that maybe you should clean your tail, but when you put your recyclables in the bin, or in the cart, you know, to debag them and throw the plastic bag out. Or because again, they're shooting themselves in the foot. They think they're doing something good, but they're just creating a real problem down the road. They again, we understand about people hiding inside their house and doing anything else. I mean, I have two bins under my sink. I have my homemade recycle and my aluminum. We we routinely clean those out because of all the swill that you know that yuck factor. But I know I don't want to put them in a plastic bag, a tea bag, or whatever. Or, or glad bag and then put it in a recycle. So homeowners actually can do what your guys don't do all the time. Correct. And I think this is one of the things that you know we struggle with kind of as an institutional recycler versus a kind of but well, people come from the residential arena, right? So kind of how do we communicate that like not necessarily it's okay that we're doing it, but but this is like this is how it works, but don't do it at home. Again, definitely don't tie your bags because there's no chance of it. Yeah, yeah, don't, you know, don't try this at home. But okay here, but don't try this at home. Uh, but I think a lot of people don't see it that far, so I'm not sure they make that connection one way or another um, because it's being collected. Most people don't hang out on our trash dock. Thank you so much for your questions, and thank both of you for your presentations and thoughtful answers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, we're going to get started. Thank you again for being here on this beautiful day. If you're on the webinar, I apologize for being a few minutes behind. We're having a very lively networking session that got started a little bit late. So thank you for being patient. If you're just joining us on the webinar, my name is Lauren Potter. I represent the Recycling Works in Massachusetts program. And we're getting ready to get started with our final session. We're going to be taking a bit of a turn from talking about single stream recycling and what goes to your typical recycling facility and moving into talking about collecting source separated materials. So we're going to get into some of those items that are on the no list, like film plastics, rigid plastics, and talk about what some entities are doing to recycle those recyclable materials that don't go in the bin but still have a market for them. So we're going to have three presenters. Um, I know we're getting started a few minutes late, so I apologize to our presenters. I'll be, you know, pressuring you as you run over. Um, and we are going to hold all questions to the end. I will definitely try to leave a few minutes for questions, and then we'll all be on the tour together. So grab your favorite speaker and continue the networking and questions. Same on the webinar, time. you can ask questions in the chat box, and we have staff standing by to report those questions to our speakers. So, without further delay, I am going to introduce Karen Franzik, who is the Green Mission Coordinator for the Whole Foods Market North Atlantic Region. Thank you, Lauren. Um, uh, thanks. Um, so, I just want to talk a little bit about our stretch plastic and our uh, number five recycling programs that we do. Um, so stretch plastic, um, this is kind of a, it's a lot of text, um, and hopefully you'll get the slide later or whatever so you can read it, so I don't want to go over everything. But essentially this is what we um, give to our team members and our customers we talk about. This is uh, stretch plastic, it's any stretch or film plastic, I always say if you can stretch it or put your finger through it, then it goes into that bin. If it's crinkly, it doesn't go in that bin. So I usually use floral sleeves, if you get flowers, that's crinkly, doesn't stretch, that's not recyclable. And I also use, well, sometimes use the example, sorry, of grapes. If anyone buys grapes at the grocery store, there's two kinds of bags. There's a stretchy plastic, and then there's a crinkly plastic. So um, for our team members, it's super helpful to say, here's the two types of grape bags you're going to see. This one can be recycled. This one cannot. Um, but essentially, we just say, if it's stretchy, you can put your finger through it, then you can recycle it. If it's crinkly, you cannot. Um, so we have a partnership with Trex, and Samara was not able to be here, so I just have a couple of her slides, that's why they're a different format here. But um, they are the world's largest manufacturer of uh, high-performance decking. So I don't know if any of you have seen, they, they make really great products, so um, I love what their different products that they make. Um, and so these are some of the facts that they have. I think it's fascinating, there's 140,000 bags essentially in a 500 square foot mm -hmm. Trex deck. 140,000 grocery bags go into that deck. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. Um, and they have done a lot of recycling. You can see in the past 10 years, they've recycled over 2.5 billion pounds of polyethylene film. So it's pretty amazing what they do. Um, we've been working with them for a long time, and they've just been a great partner for us. Um, so those are some of their products, in case you haven't seen them, so you can see what they do. Um, and then the way they actually make their composite lumber is that they take sawdust um, from flooring and cabinet manufacturers and they mix it with the bags um, and then they produce this, uh, this decking. Um, they also have this great um, uh, recycling challenge that they do uh, with schools and I think it's a, it's a great way that they try to reach beyond and make sure people understand that this material can be recycled. It's a separate recycling program. Again, it, it, and I think it's one of the biggest confusions we have in our stores, too, is everyone's like, it's recyclable. Yes, it is, but not everything goes in a single stream. So we try to make sure that we you know, talk to people about it. So specifically for Whole Foods Market stores, and, uh, and, and as she said at the beginning, I'm, I work in the North Atlantic region, which is New England. We have 41 stores and three facilities. So for our 41 stores, uh, we have signage. We partner with Recycle Across America. So the plastic bag sign is the sign that they've created. It matches all of our trash, um, compost, single stream recycling, all of our other recycling signs that we use throughout our store. So the team members recognize it. Um, from a house, we use that sign because it's the, the pretty sign. Um, and then the, the sign on the right is actually something that's provided to us by Trex. Anybody can use it. It's actually the Plastic Film Recycling Organization that has it. So we use that back of house for our team members to have more examples of what can actually be recycled. So I think it's great because it does tell you things like dry cleaning bags and 
other things that people might not think about. So, of course, we don't have dry cleaning bags in our stores, but we just want people to get the idea of what is recyclable. Um, so our, D our distribution center in Cheshire, Connecticut serves both our region and Northeast region. So there's about 80 stores all together that backhaul our, our stretch plastic to them. Um, and you can see we've done 5.7 million pounds of stretch plastic since 2010. So it's a fair amount of stretch plastic that actually gets recycled because it's very lightweight. So those, those pounds, it has to be a lot of it to add up. Um, but we've done, a, I think, a pretty good job with it. Um, and so, um, thank you. <laughs> um, and one of the things that we do um, do actually, just go back to that for a second, is um, we work with our communities too. And I know Ellen is here from Wellesley, um, and she approached me a couple years ago, I think now, and said that the Wellesley transfer station was no longer able to accept plastic bag recycling and would be taken at our stores. And I said, of course we'll take it. We're already taking it. She's like, well, there might be a lot because we're going to tell people. I'm like, but whatever signs up you want, we don't care, we'll take it. Um, and it's worked out pretty well. So, and, and we didn't get a huge rush in, but we will take it. We work with colleges as well. Um, we don't have any problem with that. Um, we get a slight income from the from trash from this, but it kind of washes out with the transportation. So we don't really make money. It doesn't cost us money, and we're happy to do it because it just works out for everybody. Um, so bonus bag options, I just put that up there because um, it is kind of a hot topic. I don't know about for this group, but in general, it's a hot topic. Um, our produce bags are regular stretch plastic. People see that they're green, and they think they're compostable, and they are not. They are regular plastic, so we do recycle them with our stretch plastic. Um, as a company, Hopeless Market has chosen not to go into the compostable bag market. We also don't have any PLA that we use in our store. So all our utensils, as I'll discuss in a minute, are recyclable number five. We don't have compostable recycle, uh, compostable utensils. We'll sell some of that stuff if you want to buy it for your own personal use. But as a company, we don't use it for several different reasons, which I'm not going to get into because it's a whole different topic, but I'm happy to talk about it if anybody has questions. Um, but we do feel like it is a contamination issue, specifically for stretch plastic. And I know when I've heard Samara talk about this before, um, as a representative of Trek, she talks about the fact that it is one of the issues they have is contamination and their stream is those compostable bags. They, they will break down. I mean, imagine a beautiful deck in the sunlight and it's going to start to break down because parts of it are compostable, which, you know. So at any rate, so they try to make sure they get those contaminants out of their stream. So. So these are pictures from our distribution center. Uh, periodically, I go there and I take pictures, or they send me pictures. So on the top left is a is a bag of uh, is a bunch of bags, and that's what we do is we actually collect our stretch plastic in bags, um, and then it gets back all to our distribution center. You can actually see in that top picture on the right, on the left left picture on the right side, you can see a white lid. So that's actually a number five lid. So that's a contaminant. Um, and then the other two bags have that, that black uh, material. That's actually number five, and it's uh, it's an insert that goes into apple boxes or peach boxes or whatever, and, and it is number five. So first of all, some people think they're recycling it because we recycle number five. It, it's in the stretch plastic, so first of all, because it's, it's a different screen, so it should be in there. But second of all, it's a thin number five, and Preserve is not able to, to recycle that. It's only the thick one. So there's a lot of different levels of teaching and learning and educating. I, I loved hearing what you said, Suzanne, because there's so much that goes into it. Um, it's amazing. But So those are just some examples of what we do for the contamination. We try to make sure we don't have the contamination. Um, so that we can help both of our partners. So, so we do backhaul everything. Um, it amazes me the logistics involved and in product and trucks full of products going to our stores and then going back with um, whether it's our cardboard bales, our pallets that we send back. They have stretch plastic and give me five. So they go back pretty full uh, and it works out pretty well that we're able to put the, the stretch plastic on top. So I'm going to um, turn over to our number five plastic program now. So um, we've been partnering with Preserve since 2008. I believe that's correct. Uh, John can correct me if it's okay. He said I'm right. All right. Um, and this has been our program since then. So I put together a little guide for our stores just to say this is what our basic program is. So we have a, either the red barrel or we have the Preserve bin. We have that's our sign that we have for everyone to know what goes into it. And we use blue bags. Why do we use blue bags? Because we have a very busy distribution setup. They get a lot of stuff coming off those trucks. Blue bag, they know it's number five. It gets sorted into number five. Stretch plastic, they know it goes over here. If there's any clear bag that has anything else in it, it usually ends up as trash now, unfortunately. We sometimes have people send a single screen back there, or they're mixed, and they, they can't do it. 
Um, and we actually use clear bags for our trash to get our recycling as well. So, um, so this is a better picture of the sign that we use. Again, we partner with Recycle Across America to have um, signs that are pretty clear. Uh, I actually really like the signs that the DEP was showing because they're similar. Um, and then we started, uh, we changed over to our coffee lids all being number five, polypropylene, uh, last year, not number six anymore. So they also can go in. Um, the biggest change, though, was that last year we changed to um, using preserves utensils. So as I said, we've chosen to go with recyclable utensils. So we were using a number five, but we ended up partnering with preserve kind of on another level. Um, and so they give us 100% recycled number five plastic in utensils, which you can come into our stores, eat your food in the cafe, wipe off your utensils, drop them into the bucket. They're going to go back on our truck to preserve and they're going to get changed into utensils again. So it's really a 100% closed loop recycling process, which we like. Um, and so this is what we're trying to do now in all of our stores, is to put this bucket with our mixed recycling, our food waste, and our trash. So this is like my ideal setup, that every cafe, no matter what you have, you should have all, all four of those options right there. We were having just the bin uh, to collect all the number fives from customers, and it was too difficult because in a lot of our stores, if you've been in our stores, we sometimes have three different setups because our cafes are long. So we want to make sure we have that at every place that you can actually get rid of anything. We should have all four options is how we look at it. Um, so getting back to kind of the contamination level, because I think that's one of the biggest questions um, most people have, we try to do as much training as we can. So on the right side is, a, is an excerpt from something we've done for our team members. We have pictures of items, we say what it is, and then we say which stream it goes into. So this is actually like a five-page document that also has food waste, and has trash, and it has, you know, single stream. So these are some of the items that we most uh, frequently do back at house. So our front of house collection has been customers could, could bring in their number five and preserve had it on their website. Uh, and then we also have the utensils. We're moving away from that to just collecting the utensils because when the program started, a lot of number five was not recyclable. Um, and John will talk more about that when he talks. But back of house, we have a lot of number five. There's more and more stuff that's made number five that we get. So we want to recycle that as much as possible. So flower pots is one. The boxes are big, though. There's more and more uh, green beans, asparagus, even some, we've started having some seafood items, some mussels and stuff come in number five boxes. So that all can be recycled. Um, and then those plastic tubs, we use those in every department in our stores, and we, we use a lot of them. Those are all number five as well. So we, and we feel we have a better ability in some ways to control back a house, to train our team members to make sure things are rinsed and clean and we're doing a better job separating. Um, Tom and Ben may, or may not disagree agree with that because they <laughs> see what our loads look like when the single stream comes here. Uh, but so we're trying to do that. And on the left is what we've tried to do to get away from bags in some ways. Because we have all these bulky items, we will just package stuff up on top of a pallet to all the number five and just wrap it and then send it back to our distribution center. It's going to get bailed at the distribution center. All of the number five gets bailed. All the stretch plastic gets bailed. All the cardboard gets bailed. We do all that separately. Um, so training is the key uh, to preventing contamination. So we've tried to come up with different guides that we can do. Um, and then we found videos are helpful, so we've actually spent some time doing some videos um, of waste diversion. And the great thing is we're able to use it for our food donation program, as well as our overall waste diversion training for any team member. So there, the, we did a lot of the same filming just to show people what, what, to, what team members would do and where things go. And we know we have a lot of streams, so we have to be very careful to educate people on what to go where. Um, we also uh, did a short video from our Zero Waste Day. Um, which was great because it shows people uh, what zero waste day looks like in our stores and what we do. So what is zero waste day, right? That's the next question. I was so excited to get to hear about Suzanne's audits and things that she does. Um, so we started in 2014. I've been with Whole Foods for 17 years, and I remember I was a team member in the region in 2007 when the first one happened. So it blew me away. I had no idea how much stuff was going into the trash that shouldn't have been, and I'd never actually seen anyone do like a real audit. So when I got this job that I have now five years ago, I said, we're doing zero waste day every year. And so far, we've been able to. So we've done five in a row. So essentially, we go through everything. We block off our trash compactor so no bags go in. We open every single bag of trash, all of our stores. We sort through everything. So we try to achieve zero waste that day. That's our goal. And in our region, we've been able to do that. Last year, our trash was about 7% for all of our stores. 
So it was great. It just shows when you actually take the time and show people and go through it what you can do. So we try to make it fun. So we have sorting areas set up. Uh, we try to do it in April or May, so it's nice weather. It's, it's Earth Month time, so people are thinking of it anyway, and they're excited. Uh, you can see the Harvey Compactor there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then these are pictures from this year. You can see the top right one, I think, is a great picture. You can see all the different streams. The baler's behind him. The stretch plastic is next to him. That's the normal setup in the store, and then he just set up right in front of it. Um, so that again, people, because the trash is right behind it. Team members go up, this is our Waterman Street store. Team members go up the stairs and the compactor door is right there. So before they get there, they have to sort through all that stuff. So it's just a lot of fun and it's something that we do every year to try and educate our team members. So thank you. That was great. Thank you so much, Karen. So up next, uh, we have John Lively, who's the Director of Environment and Materials for Preserve, who is one of the vendors that Karen just mentioned. I see the confusion now. One way to write. It took me a while to figure that out. Oh, yeah, I think I got it right. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, Quick, quick note about myself. I've uh, been at Preserve about 20 years. Karen was uh, 17, certainly. Uh, we've been working at a company for a long time. We had a great feel for its mission and what it does. I need a cool sister. Yes. Thank you. No problem. Um, I also tend to mumble a little bit where you do. <laughs> um, I hope what I have is relevant to everybody. It is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to connect in to Karen's story in a few slides, but I think it might be interesting for everybody to hear why a consumer products company is, is so focused on the end of life and the beginnings of life like we are. So a little bit about Preserve first. Um, we fashion ourselves a leading sustainable consumer goods company. We've uh, been in business for about 20 years, founded by uh, a local who grew up in Western Mass, named Eric Hudson, went to Bowson, came out of there in the mid to late 90s, saw a number of people recycling, see the blue men scattered all over Cambridge, Boston, where he lived, and decided, you know, I, I want to see these people rewarded for their efforts, and I want to see people able to buy products made from the fruits of their recycling labor. And at the time, maybe you could get coffee or paper made from recycled content. Um, I joined him a few years later, and these are, I guess, some of the fruits of our labors. Um, we have a number of products that are category leaders in their channels. Um, all of our products, I'll give you a, a video a slide in a second, show you all of them are made from recycled plastics, uh, primarily number five or polypro. Uh, we hang our hat in everything being made in the USA. It's been very important to us over the years. We have great manufacturing partners scattered throughout uh, the United States. Um, uh, finally, I'd say we have a real penchant for partnerships. We, we have loved our work and our uh, relationship with Whole Foods over the years. Certainly, they're a fantastic customer, but it's been great to get to know them on the uh, operational front as well. <coughs> We took up every inch of this slide that we possibly could with our products, and there are some that are still not on here. Um, you have two very active people over 20 years of product development, and you can go into a lot of categories. Um, I think from left to right here, you see tableware, food storage, another tableware line. Um, you see kitchen line with cutting boards and colanders, and on that far, far right here, you see our personal care line. Uh, the story I want to tell you guys starts with the toothbrush. This was our flagship product. Um, Eric launched it, I think, in 1997, maybe 1998. Uh, worked really hard to make the handle from recycled polypro. Um, probably not the greatest story to tell, but when he was first getting started, he would go into a, man, a toothbrush manufacturer, and he learned to hide the fact that he was using recycled materials. He said, you know, I'm going to wait a few meetings before I get into that, because they were going to toss him out on his ear. Recycle plastic handle and get out of here. Um, it's been a great success over the years. The toothbrush has consumed about three and a half million pounds of recycled plastic. The toothbrush contains like half an ounce of plastic. It's a lot of toothbrushes to make to consume that amount of waste. Um, we have uh, partnered with Stonyfield, uh, Plum Organics, Brita, I would 
video that's later on of people who help us find this recycled material for the toothbrush. Um, uh, we've created a great DV5 program to talk about depth and more in a second. Um, when we started with the toothbrush, it was very important for us to make that handle from recycled number five, recycled polypropylene. We ended up with a really great opportunity to highlight that in a really fantastic way, going all the way back to about 2000, 2001, when I just started at Preserve, uh, Stonyfield Farm up in New Hampshire had switched their yogurt cups from HDPE to polypro. They did a ton of work on this, right? A, a life cycle assessment at the University of Michigan that said, you know, we're going to consume less resources overall if we make this switch. And so they made the switch. What they didn't count on was their consumers saying, well, you now put me in a position I can't recycle my yogurt cups. So uh, White Mouth HDPE, number of their consumers in the early 2000s said, we can recycle these. But a white mouth polypropylene, no, I can't put that in my blue bin. People started calling Stony Fail, explaining their problems. And a uh, chance meeting at a trade show where uh, Eric and I were handing out free toothbrushes in Stony Field, literally down a few, a few tables, handing out free yogurt. And they're hearing our story about using recycled number five, and it was a match made in Tennessee. Um, we started at the time saying, well, can we take what kind of the uh, the easiest waste stream from Stony Field. Can we go up to their plant, take the yogurt cups that are waste, not not full of yogurt yet, just clean yogurt cups that they didn't use. Maybe, maybe it's misprints. Um, can we take those and clean them up and put them in a toothbrush handle? Um, worked with the folks at UMass Lowell to try all this and discovered, yes, we can. I don't want to call it easy, but it, it was not rocket science. Um, started using their yogurt cups in our handles. It was a great marketing partnership born, which is a slideshow for another conference. Um, uh, and, and we're really able to kind of check that box. It's fantastic. We've got recycled content with a great story in our toothbrush or flagship product. Um, but we didn't stop there. And uh, no business person likes to get up in front of everybody and admit their dirty laundry and their failures. Um, this is one. Um, when, when we first started the, the company, Eric was, was very intent on, out of the gates, taking responsibility for all the products we were making. And as you guys well know, you can put a toothbrush in a blue bin and have it recycled, the chance. So we offered a postage date mailer to every store out there and said, hey, let's get the toothbrushes. You could fill it up with toothbrushes, send it back to us on our dime. And we will lop the heads off that toothbrush or grind it up all together and float the polypro out and sink the nylon um, and recover the plastic in the handles. So do that for a few years, look at our take back rate. It, it's less than 1%. It's tiny, it's a very small amount. Um, next step we did was we took that postage paid mailer that insignia, which allows you guys to send it back to us on our dime, um, scanned it in, put it on the web said, hey, go to our website, just print this thing out and slap it on, you know, a piece of junk mail to the toothbrush inside and send it back to us. Even easier, our retailers were thrilled, we didn't have to deal with the bags anymore. 1% of toothbrushes back, a tiny amount. Not sure anybody was really aware of it. Um, still, still kind of stuck. stuck. Um, at the time, the toothbrush was in a rigid plastic clear container. It, it's still in that clear container in some stores. It, a great package. Um, it kind of looks like a jewel case. The toothbrush has got a funky shape to it. It's beautiful, if you will. Um, uh, and, and, and a fantastic package, but a lot of resources consumed it, and we knew it. So we're, we decided, you know, we need, we need to repackage our toothbrush. This is about 2007, 2008. Um, the white weighting that you all refer to, we were already looking at that as were a number of folks who certainly weren't the first. Um, and we decided, well, let's put this thing in a plastic pouch. Um, it worked really hard to make a plastic pouch out of all polyethylene that still looked premium. Um, couldn't pull it off. Ended up with a plastic pouch that's a little bit of a, uh, a monstrous hybrid. Got some polypropylene, got some PET, got some polyethylene. Not terribly recyclable, but very lightweight. Run our, our eco analysis on this and decide we should move forward. Let's do this. Well, what are we going to do about getting the toothbrushes back? Well, let's put this insignia on the back of this thing 
and just sell it simply as when you're done, take your toothbrush, put it back in this package and send it back to us. It was a great idea. We, we quickly got 20, 25% of toothbrushes back. Very happy, I'm like, oh, there's the key. Let's just make this really, really easy, which, which everybody here understands about recycling. It's easy, people will do it. Um, I mentioned failure. Uh, I, I used to do this and ask people, well, how much do you think it costs to send a toothbrush through the mail? Um, when we started this, it was down around 60 cents, which is a, a lot of money to pay when you're selling a toothbrush for you know, 290, 299, 295 on the shelves. We thought, well, let's, let's do this, let's get into this. You know, maybe, maybe we'll negotiate with Uncle Sam and get it down to 40 cents or 20. Or... Those went the other way. Today, to put a toothbrush in a package like that and send it back to us is, is coming up on like two dollars. It's outrageously expensive. Um, and then and, and they're not certain, certainly not blaming the postal service for this. They're, they've got a market they need to set. I mean, you know, we call it FedEx, we call it UPS. There, there's no real way to send toothbrushes around with the mail for even a whole uh, dollars. Um, in the end, we, we changed the program and if I know what slide I'm on, I can, I can, I can kind of lead you to, we changed the program because we had a collection program going on at Whole Foods. So I'm, I'm going to talk back for a second and kind of cover how we started that program and why we started it. This slide can, can generate some controversy. It's old. It's old data. Um, you can slice data a lot of different ways. But I found this to be very effective to, for people. Um, polypropylene generated in the U.S. has skyrocketed over the years. Um, the recycling rate has stayed very low. I'm sure we can argue about where these numbers really are, but I think directionally they're, they're pretty accurate. Um, and you know, as a company that was making a, a line of products for recycled polypropylene, and felt like it was also kind of part of our mission to stimulate the recycling industry and to work with folks to recover more polypro. This, this was alarming. Um, uh, our, our solution was to look at where we had uh, an audience that we could capture and say, there's another way we can recycle this. Sure, we can make some calls to single streams, talk about optical sorters, that sort of thing. Um, we're a small company, this is 12 people, I'm not sure we're really going to be able to move the needle here. Um, at the time, we had people sending us yogurt cups. They would, they would mail them to our offices and say, you know, we, we hear what you do, we still need to go farm, here's a copier box full of yogurt cups, or oh, we, we literally had someone who looked us up and brought them to us. We would drive them to bags of yogurt cups. So, so the, the idea was that people really wanted to do this. Um, we started a pilot. Um, Karen, I'm sorry, this was not with Whole Foods. This was actually with a uh, uh, natural foods co-op, uh, the Park Slope Food Co-op in Brooklyn. They, they, they started holding days where we would put a big Gaylord on a pallet and collect yogurt cups, bring your yogurt cups to us. And that was our first effort of, oh, if we get these yogurt cups after they've been used, can we actually recycle them? We went through those trials and tribulations and turned out, wow, we actually can do this. And then as we're just kind of deciding next steps, Whole Foods reaches out and has one store that says, well, I'd like to do this. And we got together with them and came up with a program that's a little bit bigger. Um, our idea, as we mentioned earlier, as Karen told you, was back home. There's a lot of these trucks going back to their DCs. Well, let's, let's collect polypropylene in these trucks and then back to the DCs, bail them up. And that allows a tiny company like us to then pick up a truckload of mailed polypropylene. Um, that turns out to be something that we can run through a process that kind of looks like this. Um, hand sort the plastic. Um, uh, at the time, we were also collecting Brita filters, which were a lot of polypro and some not polypro. Um, uh, and then kind of a, a typical polypropylene reprocessing, recycling, supply chain after that. There's some washing, some grinding and floating, um, some compounding and some some remaking, I guess, to make our products. Um, market that all together as Preserve Gimme 5. This is actually our 10th year running the program. Um, it, at the time, 
in 2008 was pitched as a program where there's not a lot of yogurt cup recycling going on. Um, there were some studies done to try to peg, well, you know, how many households in the U.S. had access to yogurt cup recycling. Um, our guess was it was down in the teens at the time. Um, since then, there's been studies that say that you know, with the rise of single stream, that's more like 65, 70, maybe even higher than that these days. Um, and that has led to some changes for the program. Nevertheless, it was still back in 2008, a number of folks looking at it saying, well, this is fantastic. And the ability for a company to step out and say, we're going to go through all of this effort to recycle this plastic. People were eager to join us and help. And we needed to help. This was has always been our most expensive form of recycled plastic. We put a lot of time and effort into it, um, in particular hand sorting. Um, we were able to turn the stream into a, uh, a stream of yogurt cups to make toothbrush handles, and then there's flower pots, and they're not going to make toothbrush handles. So a lot, lot of time and effort went into there. Um, luckily, a number of brands stepped up and said, we'd like to help. So we rolled this into essentially a sponsorship program where um, these companies were helping with the cost of recycling the products. Um, Stony Hill has always been a leader with that, as with Whole Foods. Um, over the years, we've engaged with Organic Valley, Seven Gin, Birds Bees, uh, Curry Green Mountain, Tom's Maine. Um, Berry Plastics was always an interesting one, showed up and said, we want to support you. No, we don't do much on the marketing side, which certainly was a benefit of the program, but we want to help anyway. Um, that's actually turned into a great business relationship, which maybe is going to apply to this whole program. Looking at the slide this morning, uh, this one million pounds is mainly come out of one region, and, and uh, I made an error on the slide the other morning. Um, we we operate, operate the Gimme Fry program. It's hit or miss in all regions. The million pounds over the past 10 years primarily come from this North Atlantic region. There is huge, huge room for improvement in this, no doubt. Karen mentioned cutlery. Uh, Whole Foods approached us a few years ago and said, uh, the cutlery that's flowing through our stores is polypropylene. Can you collect it in your bins? Um, okay, but if you go back a couple slides and say, well, you know, we collect stony film yogurt cups, they help us financially with the effort. So the folks who are making your cutlery, can we approach them and see if we can form a partnership? Yes. The, the company who did this said, mm, not really our cup of tea, no thank you. Um, and Whole Foods being the uh, proactive organization they are, asked us, well, could you guys make cutlery for a region or two? And so we went down this road um, and ultimately ended up, this, I think this is our cutlery at the time, this is uh, our first efforts at, at, at cutlery, recycled content cutlery. Um, it was going into those blue bins and being recycled. It was a fantastic business opportunity for us. And here's where we ended up with Whole Foods support. We eventually roll out to all of the Whole Foods stores. We've introduced a dispenser, which I didn't show here. And thank you, Karen, for showing that. That's been really key to winning some business there. Um, we make the cutlery from 100% recycled number five. Um, those processors that back in the day we were working and saying, well, can you help us grind up our yogurt cups? Those folks today are coming to us saying, we have streams of curbside polypropylene that's gone through the cleanup process, so you can put it in a utensil or a yogurt cup, i.e. it's made of food grade standards. Um, last slide. <laughs> Big point for us. Um, recycling cutlery, recycling toothbrushes, it's pretty hard. Um, the world of compostable plastics is is here um we launched to market a compostable i call it a compostable fiber line it's kind of still wrestling with what the lexicon is there um right now at whole foods and we're coming with cutlery well aware of the challenges around pha and kind of hope to leapfrog over that whole plastic area and start with newer more innovative plastics that will degrade in the ocean environment it's going to be the ultimate end goal that was really interesting. Thank you so much for 
providing a bit of a different perspective there. I really like that presentation. So last but certainly not least, I'm going to invite Roger Bellevue, who's the manager of distribution services for Stop and Shop, another supermarket that I'm sure you're familiar with. And then we will take questions for all three of our speakers at the end. Thank you. I'm probably going to cover some of the things that uh, Karen already covered, but I'm going to go into more of the distribution side of the uh, recycling than the stores. The stores are selling the product and distribution. From there, we're taking it and we're handling it. So I'm going to cover what, what goes through, what happens when it gets to the distribution side. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I went the wrong way. There we go. So what I'll cover is the things that we do. We do corrugated, we do wax corrugated, which is a different animal from the regular corrugated. We do plastic corrugated, which is basically the asparagus boxes. I call it plastic corrugated. It's a, as I learned now, it's a number five. I did not know that. Um, also, plastic bags and shrink, pharmacy stock bottles, rigid plastics, plastic carnival, corner boards, which were not mentioned earlier, and then your other items like metal, uh, paper products, things like that. Corrugated bale. So still are sending back to us in that fashion. They're about 900 to 1,000 pounds a piece. Um, we consolidate them, put them on a trailer. Brandon Whitney is our partner in all of these items that we recycle. Last year, so far this year, we've done over 170 million pounds of just corrugated. We're getting about $75 a ton. Last year, it was about $120 a ton. So that goes, that's very like cyclical, it goes up and down, and I think the whole China market did have something to do with that. I keep going the wrong way. Wax corrugated. So those are, this is a product that you'll see celery comes in this, broccoli. It's a, it's a corrugated box, but it's got a wax cor um, cover over it. So it's to protect from leaking and things like that, chicken, meat products from it. This is a tough animal because there's no money to be made in it. Um, however, we were able to recycle it. We get our stores to put it in large watermelon bins. We bring it back. We throw it a compactor because Red Whitney actually takes it and bales it for us. What they do with it, they send it overseas to India. And India takes it and has a process to take the wax off to make candles. And then whatever they do with the corrugated, I'm sure they get some revenue for that. But that actually is really uh, I'll call it cost avoidance, so it doesn't go in the landfill. It does get recycled. <laughs> There's a lot, 1.62 million pounds so far this year. Corrugated plastic. plastic, that's the number five, as we call it now. Um, again, we have our stores fill the watermelon bins with them. We ask them to break them down, fold them up. You can see they're all folded in the box. And Rand Whitney also handles that. We set it with our rigid plastic. And I'll show you what they do with the rigid plastic next. <clears throat> the rigid plastic is, is, to me, this is a very tough animal because when you're talking about it in a store, stores don't have a way to clean this stuff. All these pails, all this other material comes in, it's dirty, it's bakery with frosting in it, it's seafood with, with stuff inside of it, it's coleslaw, it's all different things that come in it. In labor at store level, and I'm sure Karen can agree with me, is very minimal. They don't want to use labor to clean out buckets. So our cooperation with this in our stores is probably five to eight percent. The rest of it ends up going in the compact or the trash because we can't get it back clean. If it doesn't come back clean to the distribution center, we have to throw it out too because we don't have a process to uh, clean that. However, we do get some of it and this goes these these materials go back to uh, Ray and Whitney, and they they have a recycling process that also uses it. They use it to um, they grind it down to make decking like tracks, but they use it for also for like making plastic totes, making uh, backboards for for your basketball courts, different items like that. Because we don't produce a lot of it, now you get into the actual plastic and shrink, and we produce a lot of plastic and shrink. One thing I didn't mention was Carol was talking about she, I guess it's 40 stores you handle. This distribution center handles over 200 stores. So our production rate is going to be a lot higher. 
they send it back again the big plastic bags all full of uh, grocery shopping bags that either customers have brought back or shrink wrap off of pallets and some of that can be a challenge also because when it comes back to the distribution center you'll find out that that bag that came out of that collection recycle bin at the store isn't just plastic bags we've had them come back with diapers in it we've had to come back with trash I mean, people will come up and they'll just throw whatever they want inside. So we have to actually sort through this to make sure that what's going into these bales is clean, somewhat clean, as best we can. Our bales, we use them as large horizontal bales to make these. So our bales are about 2,200 pounds. So we ship 18 to 19 of these on the trailer. And right now we're working directly with trucks. And they're taking it back and making the lumber out of it. Karen already went through all the Trex process, so I'm not going to talk about that. <clears throat> we also do pharmacy stock bottles. Something that came up a couple of years ago, one of the pharmacists says, what are we doing with all these bottles? I mean, can, can we recycle them? Well, yes, you can recycle them. One of the problems is, is you really need to recycle them without paper on them, without that little piece of paper, or without the caps mixed in the plastic bag. So right now, we don't do that. So all we're doing is simply putting the caps, the, the bottle, everything in the plastic bag, we're also sending that to Trex, and they're sorting through it. They're not giving us any money for it, whereas the plastic we're getting about, I think we're about six cents a pound right now. It used to be 17, now it's six. But this here, they're, they're actually handling it for us, so it takes it out of the landfill, it takes it from the pharmacy and into a process where it gets recycled. They do grind it down, they make pellets out of it to, again, create their Trex boards. And then corner boards. These corner boards come off of, um, <clears throat> mostly off of banana pallets. They're just a board that goes down the side of each corner of the pallet and wraps it around to hold that pallet together. It's a good solid plastic that this company, Angleboard, uh, takes for us. If we build these bales into over 2,000 pounds a piece, they'll give us 11 cents a, um, per pound. Right now, because we can't, we can't seem to get them really nice and tight and snug. We only do about a six to seven hundred pound bale, and we get about six cents a bale uh, a pound. But it still takes it out. This is something that used to go to the landfill. And they also make a cardboard one, so we also <laughs> bail up and we put that in with our corrugated uh, that goes away with me. Yes, that was it. Uh, we also recycle things like metal from our stores and paper products, paper products, and all those other items. Um, as far as training at store level, that's done with the store. They each store has a green captain. That their, their goal is to make sure that all the departments know what the right thing is to do. What can you recycle? What you can't recycle? And things like that. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. That was really great as well. And thank you for being so quick and efficient. We have time for questions, Roger. Actually, if you want to hang out up in this area, and I could invite Karen and John back as well. And that way we could take questions for all three of you. Um, I just want to start with a quick question from the webinar that we received that was um, in response to Karen's presentation where she mentioned the difference between stretchy plastic and crinkly plastic, such as those around, you know, a bouquet of flowers. And they were wondering, they, I think, went to a resource, a website, and the plastic recycling website, and found that crinkly plastics may be recyclable in other streams. Do you have, have an outlet for that, or is that strictly trash right now? Okay. There's, so. Their specific question was about the cereal box liner, or the cereal bag oh, liner. Bags within cereal boxes. Because on the website it stated that it is considered plastic film, but it, it is really stretchy. isn't stretchy. So that was a very specific example of they in question. Um, I don't know if you have a better answer. I just refer those questions directly to Trex. I'll just ask them and they'll tell me if they can take it or not. The one we get sometimes, which is similar, is vegetable bags on the freezer, uh, fruits and vegetables. And there's apparently a polymer that's mixed in. So even though some of them could be recycled, Trex doesn't want any of them because some of them cannot be in their containment. Okay, opening it up to the room, um, 
I will shimmy the mic. I'm going to start with John and then you and then you. Hello, this um, question is for John. Um, John, most of the recycling centers now are asking for the bottle, plastic bottle caps to be taken off the yeah. water bottles. Is that some material that you can use? Is that a number five? Yes, it is. <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh. Same question. So, so the question is, uh, recycling centers are encouraging people to put the bottle cap on PET bottles. Um, we find that particularly exciting. The PET bottle is what we call a carrier. It's a great carrier. Um, and, and understand the technique is you grind it all up. The bottle cap polypropylene generally floats in the water. The PET generally sinks in the water. And PET reclaimers are like, wow, we've got another stream of material now. And uh, I can tell you that uh, we're tapping into that stream through through some processing partners. So it's great to see. Awesome. Thank you. Um, do you still have a question? Okay. I was just curious what your thoughts were with all these plastic bags. I know some of you are sending them out. Um, are the majority of the grocery stores sent them out? Yeah. 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 So the question was regarding uh, plastic bags and whether the grocery stores are sending those with the rest of their film plastics. Uh, yeah, they, they are. And I, I'm pretty sure it's EPA who had a program last year or something with a wrap. I can't remember what it was called. It was in Connecticut. So there's a lot of uh, different, uh, actually, do you know, work? I know the um, EPA did partner with the state of Connecticut on yep. the wrap program to take back plastic bags. Exactly. Wrap. Every grocery store that I know of accepts plastic bags. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I think in our stores, of course, we don't have plastic bags in our takeouts, but we do have them in produce in other places. And a lot of customers just have plastic bags. I order from Amazon and I get all kinds of bubble wrap and stuff. So I think it's more and more we're trying to find outlets for that. Cool. Thanks. And we have one more question in the room that I know is waiting and then we'll to the webinar question. This question is for Roger, more so Roger, I believe. So I did some quick math, and it seems like you're doing 6.3 million in corrugated annually, roughly. Yes. Um, have you ever done an ROI? Or what would your question be on an ROI? Like the effort and labor, and uh, you know, personally for a stop and shop to uh, balance that, if that makes any sense. So you're you're, you're taking in 6.3 million. What's the, the labor and effort to do that work? Uh, you know what? I'll be as efficient as I can. Jump over more. <laughs> okay. So, so our stores have been bailing that corrugated now for. I've been with coverage 39 years, and we've been bailing it for 39 years. So, not every store was bailing at that time, but we gradually got it all all the way. So, an ROI was probably done way back then. But nothing's been done since that time. To give you an actual response to that. Okay, any other questions? Oh, we've got one in the room. Hi, everybody. Um, I was just curious uh, if any of your organizations or how your organizations might be uh, collaborating with the How to Recycle program. I know Karen kind of flashed it up on the screen. Um, as a, a brand, it's something that we're actively rolling out um, as we've seen some big retailers like Amazon and Walmart um, jump on board. So just curious from both a technical perspective, how you're informing that um, you know, effort as well as how it might be translating to uh, you, know, you encouraging brands that are in your stores to apply it. Thanks. We're using some similar techniques to what Whole Foods is using as far as teaching our associates on how to recycle, what to recycle. We have the same uh, banner, if you will. So we first did um, the so plastic. Talking about the, 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 the um, like a specific type of uh, logo that you that companies are putting on their products to inform consumers. I'm going to say I have to have a quick opinion. Um, we rolled out on one of our lines a little while ago. I haven't heard anything from consumers about it, um, but our perception is it's fantastic. Um, there's a lot of uh, recycling triangles all over, lots of stuff that can't be recycled, 
and you know, I think these folks going out there and saying we're going to try to put a stake in the ground is great. Um, I certainly think it's it's going to be hard as they kind of dive down into things. But that first step with things that are obviously recyclable in a ton of places like <laughs> easy bottles is fantastic, in my opinion. Um, I'm not sure. I know we've not received any pushes from stores or customers to do it, and I'm not sure if you guys are. I think there's two two different questions is how I'm hearing it. One is what is our uh, communication to customers so they understand and how do we maybe message to them as well as our back of house processes. Uh, back of house processes um, are a tad more complicated this year than last year because Amazon is now our owner. So there's a lot of different processes we're still working through to integrate with them sustainability wise so that we and better leverage the, the combined companies. Um, so I think that that's something that will happen. Um, and they're really good at that kind of messaging once they kind of have a program. So I think there'll be more with that. As far as customers go, uh, you all know whether you're in a Whole Foods, a Stop and Shop, there's only so many signs you're going to see. There's only so much you can do. Um, so we try, I think every store, every retail tries to be very um, uh, uh, specific about what signs we use and how we do it. So that's why you're not going to actually see that sign in our store because it's too busy and it doesn't kind of match our messaging. Um, but I think we love to partner with people. So if you had a, a promotion you were doing, we're happy to have that and say we're partnering with them. Like the RAP program in Connecticut, I know our stores did that. It's the EPA program just to say we are also and the stop and shop companies did that too. So I think it, it's something that there's more opportunity, but I don't know how much conscious thought there is you now. Great. We have time for maybe one more question. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I'm not as able to say it technically, but um, Mr. Uh, Bovedrov, um I just kind of was curious in the back office, are you paying, is, okay, is payment to ship, are you always trying to figure out if that's more cost effective than trash hauling? Is, is that why you're doing any of these things? Because it's more cost effective? I'm just curious. That's a great question. It is. Very, very good question. It's not all about cost effective. So uh, we're owned by a company called Ahold, which is Netherlands, is now Ahold Gillies. And one of their goals is to be zero waste by 2020. So everything that we can do to take things out of the landfill we're doing. It's not always about the cost. It's about pro we call it about profit, people, and planet. What can we do to be better at all those all those different things? So some of the streams that we're doing are actually costing us money. Right. So it doesn't we don't look at that as a whole. Obviously, we're not gonna do something that's gonna cost us a fortune, but we are not gonna shy away from doing something just because there's a small cost to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, one more for real this time. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, Are you sure? Yeah, okay. So this one is actually for Ben, and it was along those lines. I bought up today. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Thought process. Obviously, there's a cost for recycling to do commercial institutional. I would love right? the microphone. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Why not? So there is a cost to recycling, right? And we're learning that, and it's going up, right? And I'm just curious, from your standpoint, is there still a cost incentive? to avoid trash, right. right? There's still an incentive there, or do you see and anticipate there's a spot that, that the equilibrium will change? Great question as well. So uh, how can I answer that? Excuse my back. Um, <laughs> there is a cost to recycle. There's a cost to move material. Whether they're moving bales back to their distribution center, or we're sending a roll-off truck out to pick it up and bring it back. Um, you know, when somebody asked the question about, um, you, you know, is it sustainable or is, does it make sense? It makes a lot of I wish they would put it in a compactor and send their cardboard to me, but it makes a lot of sense to do what they're doing. All we need to realize is that somebody has to pick up that expense. It's not the hauler that's going to pick it up. It's not the manufacturer that's going to pick it up. It's not the resident that's going to pick it up, but there is a cost to do these things. I mentioned earlier about the uh, disposal prices we're in. We're seeing disposal prices go get higher and higher, especially here in the Northeast, where we're losing that million million tons of capacity that we have. That puts pressure on the market. That makes us look at the different things that we do, and, and maybe they might not make sense to do today, but they will make sense to do in the future. 
I think we need to we we need to continue to look at all of those things as as they come about. It's still if it costs money, and as Roger said, not if it's going to cost a fortune. But a lot of the a lot of the recycling programs that we've seen and we've established and we as a company have established over the years have cost somebody some money to do, to run. But it makes environmentally sense. It makes economic sense in some cases. And it gets you into that stream. All we need to realize is that we need the markets to move this stuff into, and then we'll we'll, we'll figure this out. So I'm not sure whether I really answered your question, but wherever, wherever the cost is, somebody's got to pick that up, and, that, and that's that's all. It's important. Stay cheaper than trash. It's certainly so they're so, taking out of the incentive. So so there is certainly an economic incentive in the northeast quadrant because of the disposal. As we start to see disposal prices reaching $100 a ton or higher, then it's going to make a lot of sense to do some of the things that we're, we're, we're currently doing that's costing us $70, $80, $90 a ton. It, it, it just makes sense. In parts of the country where disposal prices are $25 a ton and single stream processing is $70 a ton, there's some hard decisions that need to be made. You, you know, I get a report every, every week about different parts of the country that have stopped recycling programs because of the expense to do that, or they put them in hiatus, or they they close facilities down. So it, it depends on coast and coast, yeah, maybe central, but some of these rural areas that have that have cheap disposal, that's that's where it's going to go. Oh, you you up. <laughs> I think this is a great place to wrap up. These are such excellent questions. I want to thank all of our speakers from this last session again, as well as everyone who presented, helped us organize, Yale Harvey especially, for hosting. All of you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, those of you that are going to take the tour.